session of the Kansas State Board of Education. Please notice that all board members are present, and I understand that there's going to be a proposed uh, addition to the agenda. Betty? Uh, yes, Chairman Porter, and I would like to add to the uh, agenda a motion to review PPC. Okay, how do we go about doing that, Mark? Can be more specific. Is that related to something that occurred yesterday, or is that on on the, uh, the it, PPC it, recommendations? Yeah, it so would be a recommendation. You'd like to, and you'd like to make a motion to reconsider the outcome, or just no? Uh, I think it's, 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 it's an additional, it's an additional, additional, additional then, aspect. Then of I think if you would uh, just make that motion and be specific what it is you're wanting to to uh, motion to amend the agenda for today, for the purpose of adding to the PPC. Okay, uh, so, so I had discussion about PPC uh, membership. membership, future reference. And that's my motion. Okay, and, and Janet seconds that motion. So we will vote on that, and then that becomes part of the agenda, and we're voting on that motion, not the agenda right now. Everybody understand? All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Motion carries. Now, a motion would be in order to approve the agenda as amended. Yeah. Melanie and Jim. All in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? We have uh, our next item agenda is act on the Kansas Advisory Council for Indig Indigenous Education Working Group mascot reform statement and recommendations to the Kansas State Board of Education and Kansas Board of Regents. Uh, Ann, do you have anything to add? Yes, I wanted to note, and you can't probably see them because they're back behind the post, but uh, if you guys wanted to come up today, we have, in case you guys have questions, Dr. Alex Redcorn, assistant professor at K-State in uh, Education Lead Leadership, Olivia Brin from the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and of course, Raphael Wasik from Prairie Band Potawatomi Tribe. So. Uh, these guys have just been amazing helping us put all this together and got a lot more work to do. But um, anyway, we wanted them here in case you had questions about the motion. Do you want me to go ahead and make the motion? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I move that the Kansas State Board of Education accept and affirm the Kansas Advisory Council for Indigenous Education Working Group mascot reform statement and recommendations to the Kansas State Board of Education and Kansas Board of Regents. The board makes a strong recommendation to Kansas K-12 non-tribal schools to adopt the actions recommended in the statement and retire Indian-themed mascots and branding as soon as possible, but no longer than within the next three to five years. Thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Jim McNeese seconds that motion. Michelle. Thank you, Chairman Porter. So this is where I would talk about my comments or statements, or because we're ready to take a vote, correct? We have a motion. And so we're ready to take a vote, but I can make this, a statement. At, you can make a statement. Yes. Okay. All right. And thank you. And thank you, Ann. And thank you for your work on this. Um, when I reached out to, you know, because we had a month, we've had a month now. And, and when I've reached out to people, um, I talked to a good friend of mine. He grew up on a reservation in northeastern Kansas. His grandfather went to Haskell University. Um, one of the comments that he made to me is that he didn't feel that it was a state board issue. He's kind of like with the, what happened with the multiplier rule. Once I went down into the communities and started talking to people about and, and, and building those relationships, talking, it, it takes a lot of work. I mean, you have to go to each, each community because it, effect, it affected a lot of different communities, that uh, multiplier rule that we voted on the month before. Um, the focus was, and this is what it's going to be in my opinion today, the focus will be you, they either voted against it or they voted for it. Not, and that's 10 people deciding for the whole state of Kansas and those communities and those traditions and, the, and, and what's happening in those communities without, you know, talked about two to five years or whatever, that's what needs to happen is the building the communities, building the relationships, the things that we heard, many people didn't hear last month. They weren't tuned in. They're working, they're busy with their lives. And until they know the reasons why or the, what, what's going on or building the relationships within the communities like you could be doing with those those, those um, communities that have those labels on their mascots or whatever, they, they have pride, they have traditions, 
they're not going to understand. They're not going to, it's going to take a while for education, curriculum that you're working on, you're building that. What would be, since it's a strong recommendation on that part, I'm not sure why we're taking a vote at the state board because 10 people are deciding for the rest of those communities where that's the relationships you build with those people. He talked about education. He said curriculum. Yeah, there's a couple. He thought maybe there were a couple that could have bad connotations in Kansas. I could, I could mention those two schools that he mentioned. But he said those have to be built on relationships, education. You go in into those local communities, going into those local having school boards, public having public information, having public comment, because that today, if I if I vote no or I vote yes, they're going to be like, well, she. They all voted yes, so we're strongly encouraging that. But it's a recommendation. It's not a, tied to accreditation. They don't have to do it. They they might feel pressured to do it, but I don't want them to feel pressured. I want that to be a community building relationship. You you said some uh, different families spoke had some great things that. that you know, those kids in those other schools aren't probably learning or learning about, and that's they're talking about that at um, the you know uh, KBOR level. We're talking about that and, and how how we're teaching that to the teachers that are going out into the teaching field and what they could be learning with the curriculum. So I just want to say it since it's a strong recommendation only. It's not a mandate. It's not tied to accreditation. I'm not sure why we're taking that vote at the State Board of Education because it's tying it's it's putting us in a in a bad situation where then I'm having to go out and defend a vote on something that's only a recommendation, kind of like with the multiplier rule. It affected the whole state in different ways, and it didn't, it didn't even address the, the issues that were happening within uh, uh, the certain schools that it was affecting with those local 4A schools. So um, I had to go out and defend it. I was able to do that, fortunately, um, to speak with people for three, it took three hours, and they all had questions for me. They had great ideas. I said, why aren't these being brought to Keisha or the legislation? You guys have better ideas than what was even proposed. And so you guys may find that when you go into the communities, they may have, we want, we, we've been wanting to change that mascot for years. I mean, they may, they may want to do that, but they don't know what they don't know. And with us just doing a blanket, you're going to strongly, we're strongly encouraging that. We're going to take two to five years. It's going to take some time to build those relationships with those communities. And I just want to say, make that statement today, whether I vote yes, whether I vote no, I just wanted that to be public, public, and this is what I was hearing from this ch this child, that, or my good friend that grew up on the reservation in, in Kansas, and this was coming from him as a, as a boy growing up in in those communities and what he what he had to live with, and I did, I'm, I was glad I reached out to him because he's a good friend of mine, and and um, and got his perspective on that. So that's mm -hmm. all I'll say. Thank okay. you. Okay, Mel Melanie. Thank you, Chairman Porter. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I just wanted to clarify, this guidance from the State Board lays the groundwork for those types of conversations. Um, it's really not any different than when we voted and approved um, guidance called Navigating Change during COVID. Um, that wasn't a mandate for districts, but there are districts that aren't having these conversations or that are having a hard time with these conversations. And so when we take a leadership role at the state level and say this is something that you should look at, um, I think that that's really important messaging that some of those districts need, and they need some of that support. And so I'm, I'm hoping that we can be that support today. Um, I do want to clarify, I have read that this might impact accreditation, and I wondered if the department has a response to that. This does not have any impact on accreditation. This is a recommendation the motions of recommendation from the state board is not tied to accreditation in any way. Thank you. And I was going to say the same thing, but she said it more articulately than I would. Ann? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I just want to make it clear to everybody, um, we're n these 10 people are not deciding anything for anyone. All we're doing is asking these schools that have these mascots and branding to start a conversation about is this mascot, is this branding tied to real learning, or is it an empty moniker that makes fun of other sovereign nations? So we're just asking them to start the conversation. I mean, if, if anybody knows what you're talking about, it's these three folks about how tough it is to go into a, a, a community and start that conversation. And that's why the statement contains a whole host of resources and these folks will be available as resources and others to go if a district wants to have that conversation to, um, to invite them in and they will be there to answer any questions, 
give them the background, but this absolutely is a state board issue. For one thing, more than 90% of Native American students attend public schools. These folks and others represent the four sovereign nations, tribal nations in Kansas, requesting to us as a government-to-government -government request to consider asking our schools to take a look at their policies. And as I mentioned last month, you know, our <coughs> foundational structures have discussions of equity and fairness, and we did a whole task force on bullying, which sometimes if you heard more stories, you would understand how these mascots uh, encourage actually bullying in public school settings. But there are a lot of reasons why, um, you know, our, our stand on equity, our stand on justice, our stand on bullying, this absolutely fits into the policies and vision that this board has for public schools. And like I said, we're not saying anybody's gonna lose their accreditation. What we're asking them to do is one, look at their own policies. I think it was Shawnee Mission found that when they looked at their own local district policies, having that mascot violated their own policy. They had to make the move. So we're just asking them to start the conversation, do the research. We will have resources available for any district that wants to start that conversation, and, um, and I hope they do. But I think this board needs to take a leadership role in putting our money where our mouth is. When we say we don't want bullying, we want equity, we want the best education for every child then this absolutely fits with our, our mandates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jean. Thank you. I would like to thank the working group for the statement and recommendations. I've received feedback from across my district, and I believe this is a local control matter, and that the decision on district mascots and branding is the prerogative of the districts without the added pressure from the state board or the department to influence their local districts. Um, I, I, uh, I think there is a lot of uh, valuable information in the statement that districts can and should consider, but at the end, this is the district's decision. Thank you. Dina. Actually, it's for me. I couldn't get on. <clears throat> thank you for being here, and thank you for taking the leadership role in this on this issue. Um, I, I believe this is, well, it is a local issue. We're just making a recommendation. And I think as, and, and as a board, um, we typically make a lot of decisions that affect a lot of people. And it, I think it's appropriate that we, uh, in fact, it's important that we make a statement as a board uh, where we see, uh, or where the direction we see the state should go on this issue. I was unaware of how, um, as, a, as a high school principal, I was unaware of how the mascot naming and branding affected people. You have come to us very politely and very nicely and said, this is offensive. This hurts us. This is something we'd like to see changed. When I find that something that I'm doing, uh, regardless of my intent, but that find out that it's hardy, harmi, harming, hurting, demeaning someone, I think it's appropriate that we take the position that we change. It's not that you have to change or tolerate what we do. So I will be voting that we uh, send a strong message to the districts, because we are the leadership of the state in education, to move forward to remove all those images, traditions, and things that, that uh, quite frankly, we don't, we, we just didn't know, you know. But we know now, so take the action now. Thank you. Dan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a couple questions, and, and there may be answers or may not. So with this, there's been several entities that have tried to pass similar um, recommendations. NCAA has before. How successful have these kind of measures been to actually change mascots from a governing body level? 
in terms of their outcome. I think the, they're probably just uh, mixed results, um, if I'm being honest. And um, but it does start a conversation that over time um, does does a lot more. It can be productive over time as people work through in their local context what that actually looks like for them. Um, other states have done it and it's moved the needle. Um, for example, Maine, I believe, um, no longer has any mascots, and so um, it. It, there's mixed results, it depends on um, when and where and if the dialogue kind of continues as people work through the nuance. And um, to go back to the original point is this is really, um, this is really the start of the work. Um, this is the start of the dialogue. This is the, the initiation of that dialogue where people start to actually learn about these things and because pe once people start actually learning and peeling back the layers, that's when the actual change okay. starts to occur, so. Okay. Um. And then, so what? What is that next step? Because it doesn't, it can't stop here. Because well, we can't, we can't go into a district and say you're going to change your mascot tomorrow. No, but so so we wrote into the pol we wrote into the recommendation specific action steps um, to ask people to review their policies, start community conversations, uh, start the community education process, um, start reviewing what it would take in those local contexts. Does, does that involve you? Uh, I mean, uh, as an organization, uh, not you personally. I so, so think, it, I think uh, we've, that we've had that conversation. Itself? We've had that conversation where it's going to involve a lot of us, um, mm -hmm. and that's why we also wrote in the recommendation that we're willing to engage in those conversations. And that that really is a lot of labor to go to all these mm -hmm. communities and and do this work. And so, um, but we feel passionate about it, and um, that's why we're going to. Um, if this passes and these conversations start, then we start the process of making sure that we're um, trying to tend to the needs of these communities and yeah. initiate these conversations, endure the conversations, and keep them going. Because one of my fears is that we pass this and nothing changes, in which case this has been an exercise in futility. And I'm not a big fan of exercises in futility uh, at all, where there are definitely concrete action steps we could take as a board like taking Native Americans out of our other category. Mm -hmm. That that appalls me. Same thing with, with our Asian population. They should be on our state documentation as a standalone. Um, and yeah, I know. But those are concrete steps that we can take as a board and actually deliver on. And we're taking a, a vote today to make a recommendations to districts to, hey, you need to look at this. But if none of them change, what has happened? No. Uh, and that and that is a concern that I have. Um, on the same token, I believe every student should be welcome in our public school system. Every student. I don't care. And the stories that we've heard last month, and I've heard them before last month, I is atrocious. Um, as, at state competitions. Uh, um, and some of the stories that you've shared earlier this year. Um, that should never have happened. And um, I... I I completely ag agree with the premise that we need to have a real conversation. Um, it's, you know, what if nobody changes, what then? Um, does this go away or do we try something else? Um, and, and that's a question for later, probably not for today. But that, that is a real concern that I have as we do this and nothing changes. I share, I'll be honest, I'll share that concern. And um, I believe what we're asking the, the state board to do is initiate that conversation and help us sustain that conversation. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And if we don't do something, we know nothing's going to happen. <coughs> Betty? Betty and then Janet. Thank you. Um, there were so many things that I never thought of or I was never aware of until this came up. It actually touched my thought process. So I wholly support initiating this action, saying to local boards, we need to start this conversation. I think there are a number of people that just hadn't really thought about it. I mean, if it didn't hurt you and, and no one says that your words or your actions hurt them, you don't know. Um, you have brought to our attention a matter that really shouldn't have gone as long as it did. Uh, I wholly support moving forward 
with the idea of starting the conversation. No, you can't guarantee anything. You can't say, well, when we start the conversation, it's going to be successful. We don't know. But at least there is a beginning to the end. I don't know how long it will take to, for us to get there, but I like the idea of starting the conversation, of being able to bring this awareness to local school boards, to communities, that this is, this is something that's very hurtful and destructive and should not be allowed to continue. We talk about uh, diversity, equity, and the last one, inclusion. That means we have to include everyone. So I am in total support. I don't know where the road is going to take us, but we're not gonna go anywhere if we don't start. And this is a good start, so I will be in support of that. Thank you. Janet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am in total support of this. I am, uh, I'm shocked that we didn't hear this before. <laughs> we should have known this a long time ago, to be honest with you, you know. I've been here 24 years, and this is really the first time this issue's ever came to us, you know. However, I do, and I, I'm going to support it because I think this is tragic that these things have happened, and, and, uh, and, I, I, and I apologize that, that uh, they have. I think that it's very sad. But uh, I do have one question, and uh, because it's something I've been told, uh, I have been told that there are a few districts that do have contracts signed with tribes to use the mascot. Uh, so is that being taken into consideration, I guess is my question. So we, we've had, um, because those questions came up, um, since we sent this to the board in the first place, we've had discussions about that. And because we center the concept of self-determination, um, we've talked about the fact that if, um, we've kind of established a criteria that we can offer up at some point, um, but we've already kind of walked through a criteria of about four things that say, if you have um, a written partnership um, with the legislative body of a tribal government, if, if you share that name with them, for example, if your tribe A is your city name or your school name and there is a tribe A maybe in Oklahoma that you've reached out to and you have some sort of formal partnership and you're actually doing substantive learning about that tribe within your community and um, you're not doing caricatured um, uh, imitation of Indian people and, and students are learning from that. So we have a set of uh, criteria that we've discussed and agreed upon to offer guidance when, as this unfolds and as it kind of moves forward to help districts who are in that unique context where a tribe is actually saying, hey, we are in partnership with these people and there's substantive learning about our people happening in that community. If, if those are things that can be said, then um, we've offered, we've ha we have guidance on that. Thank you. Dina, is this you or Jim? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have already made comments such as I'm going to make to the tribal members who are here today. But the fact that the, uh, that the, all the reservations exist in my board district currently is not the reason I talk about this. I grew up as a Clearwater Indian and as an alumni that's near and dear to my heart. But when I hear after visiting with those individuals that they now do the tomahawk chop and they do other things that are demeaning when there are, I mean, if I was a member of a tribe and I was in a competitive environment, I would take that as making fun of me. 
and bullying is another component. It's a way to show that you can overtake someone else. And that makes the, the person who actually is a Native American, if it makes them feel less of a person because of that, it's wrong. And despite the fact that I grew up as a Clearwater Indian, I have visited with my folks from back home and told them when I found out they were doing things like the tomahawk chop and so on, and particularly at um, the state, any kind of regional or state competitions, told them what it really is, what they're really doing to the Native Americans who are on that opposing team. And I said, I think we ought to be ashamed that we're putting them in that, that position. So I will be supporting this as well because I think the time to have a conversation has long passed and we need to make certain that it takes place as soon as possible. So if our recommendation goes very, falls on deaf ears, that's up to the board in the future to make the determination if they want to take it further. It isn't up to me at the moment. I'll give them the opportunity to have the discussion and make the decision locally because that's where it needs to be to rest. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ann. We'll have the last word and then we're gonna vote. Thank you, I just wanted to thank everybody for the thoughtful discussion and respectful and I know um, we've kind of represented here the stuff that's gonna come out after you know this, this vote is made should it go. Uh, Positive, and I, I want to thank Dr. Redcorn because I imposed on him last week. <laughs> Some of you know about my coffee group. He zoomed in and talked about mascots to my coffee group, and we kind of heard, didn't we, kind of what's gonna gonna come out. And I, I think the thing that really struck me about what he presented to the group was how this can be tied to education. You know, when they one person said, "Well." why don't we just get rid of the name Kansas and Atlanta Braves? And he explained that, well, no, you keep Kansas and you teach the kids about the Kaw people who are here and why it's called Kansas and there are lots of layers of education that can go along with it. But the Atlanta Braves, that's just an empty moniker and they make fun actually of Indian people. So there's a big difference there. But I'm really excited about the levels of conversation. I think if this vote passes that it will begin. And um, as Dr. Horse said, long overdue. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. We know what the motion is. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Abstain? That would be seven, one, and two. Thank you very much. We hope that this does not end here. Uh, we want to maintain uh, uh, relationships uh, because as Jim, I think it was Jim, said, everybody needs to feel affirmed. Every student, regardless of anything, needs to be welcomed when they walk into any school in Kansas, and we want to make sure that that happens. Thank you for your help. Doug, are you here? Good 
Mr. Chairman, board, members of the board. Uh, let's go through some ESSER this morning. So, uh, starting with ESSER 2 changes, we've got seven districts that submitted ESSER 2 changes. Uh, not a lot of money involved in this. Their total plans are 10.7 million, but when we look at uh, the total changes, it's only about $160,000 that we're talking about in, in these ESSER 2 changes. Um, Remington, uh, they're going to use up the rest of their ESSER 2 allocation. Uh, maybe about 50% of that is for them getting an outdoor classroom up and running, so the different pieces, tables, furniture, those types of things to, to get that outfitted. Um, Cheney uh, is going to use some money for an extra math teacher tutor type, type position. Uh, Pratt using some money or moving some money around for some behavioral support salaries. Uh, Paradise is using up the rest of their allocation for some curriculum math supplements. Otis Bison moving some money around or using the rest of their money for after school tutoring. And then Dodge City is moving some money to provide retention pay to their staff and Leavenworth uh, moving money around for some more special education positions. So salaries for those. So as we look at our totals then, like I said, it's only $160,000, so it really doesn't have a big impact on our cumulative, uh, still sitting at about 76% for those teaching and learning activities. Questions about SR2? Motion would be in order to approve the ESSER two allocations. Uh, Dina makes the motion and Betty seconds the motion. Any further discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Nine to one. Thank you. Okay. Nine zero one. <laughs> So moving on to the new ESSER three plans, we've got 16 districts that uh, submitted plans for this month or that we have ready for, for your approval. Uh, $20 million in those, and then we've got six districts that have some ESSER three changes, and that will be another $20 million in net change. As we look at where we're at, you all have approved 158 plans. We've still got two that are under that conditional approval from Last February, uh, 16 new plans today, 86 plans that have not been submitted, and then 26 under review. That's what it was earlier in the week. We may have gotten a few more uh, since our last meeting. That means we've had seven, or 15 new plans submitted since last month. So we're still pushing districts for that December 16th to get their initial S or 3 into us so that we can get those to you, hopefully by the March board meeting. Uh, just the demographics again, uh, 27 million was at the disposal of these 16 districts. They're using 20 million of it. Looking at the ranges, uh, expenditures per district, Hamilton is the low end at 123,000. Garden City is the high end at 5.6. And then uh, per student spending, Garden is the 625 and Paradise is the 2694. The expenses themselves just in this batch represent 79% approximately for the teaching and learning activities. And then as we look at our cumulatives, you know, uh, puts us at about 79% still. Uh, $20 million today leaves us with 207, and we've still got $20 million more in changes that will drop that down to 187 left that um, has not been spoken for. Questions about these recommendations? Go ahead. Then the ESSER 3 changes, uh, Marmoton Valley. Uh, little money for an after school program. Brewster using up the rest of theirs for uh, it's a pretty small HVAC project, so I'm not sure if this is paying for the rest of it. Maybe part of it was in S or two, but it, that's what this is for. Uh, for Colby, uses up the rest of their allocation. 
districts have to, if they get a certain amount, dollar figure in federal funds, they have to do a single audit. So a lot of our districts have never had this much money and never had to do that. So this is an added expense. And so Colby is going to use some of their funds to pay for that audit that they now are required to do, which is perfectly fine. Um, Pratt, some money for software. Gary County is adding money for retention pay and after school uh, tutoring. And then Kansas City is using up the rest of their allocation for retention pay and some technology to deliver instruction to students. Like I said earlier, um, $20 million in the changes, so that drops us down to $187 million left that we still um, need to encumber or at least have a plan for, uh, still setting at 79% for teaching and learning activities. Questions, comments? To remind everybody, this uh, all this goes through a uh, as a review committee. I mean, besides after they get through with it, it goes to the uh, uh, task force on ESSER that we meet on Fridays before the board meetings. Uh, and Janet and I both represent you on that board. So this has already been vetted by the group many times uh, and then through that process. And we always get that information early and go through it. So. It's time for a vote, isn't it? Yep. Is there a motion to approve the ESSER 3? Betty makes that motion, and Dina seconds the motion. Any further discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Abstain. 9-0-1, thank you very much. And because, as which, which is extremely unusual, we are ahead of schedule. We're going to add, at this point, Betty, we're going to uh, uh, entertain your motion about the Professional Standards Board, or, or Professional Practices Commission. Thank you, Chairman Porter. And um, to offer a prelude into that, it's my understanding that PPC has challenges when it comes time to um, fill positions and that there are many times individuals um, don't uh, appear or come in when, it's, when their service is needed. And given the fact that we do have um, qualified candidates that have already been vetted, I believe that uh, instead of asking PPC to come forward with us each time and opening occurs that we allow them to use their uh, existing list to fill positions as they are needed. So my motion is um, I move that we um, allow PPC the opportunity to use a their list of qualified candidates to fill positions as they become available. So, so the, I mean, if I explain the motion, that since we had more qualified candidates yesterday than we had positions, you are, their motion would say that the people that applied yesterday that have already been vetted do not have to reapply. Is that is that the motion? That's the motion. Thank you. Okay. Did you, Dina? Um, does that mean that they could just automatically, are you suggesting that they could just automatically fill those positions without our input? Well, the same. As a, the, I should say the board's input. The same input uh, we had yesterday when we looked at the list of qualified candidates. So I'm not suggesting that that list be expanded but that those two names remain there for them to use if the need arises. I'd say, and that, to that, I can agree. Is there a second? Is, so is that a second? Okay, uh, Ann. Okay, my question is, does that violate the regulations on how PPC members are chosen? If you approve that slate of candidates from yesterday in this motion, that, that would still come back to you as, as a vote when that opening occurs. So the PPC really can't just 
choose somebody off the list. We have to approve them, That's right? correct. But you're approving so those. can we even do what her motion says? Yes, I believe that you can. It just means when they come back again, these people you're, would be on the list. You're appointing them, in essence, be, when there's a, another opening versus having them reapply. If they fit the description, like, for example, if we have an administrator and there's an administrator That's opening. That's correct. Or if, but not, for example, if, I mean, we do try to keep a balance, too. Right, an administrator, uh, administrator couldn't fill a teaching position. Right, the, so there's two things. One is it has to fit the opening, yeah. right? But the other is, I don't, how many people are there on the PPC altogether? Nine, I believe. Nine, so we try to keep a balance of across the 10 districts. We still can't fill, fill all the 10 districts, so are we gonna ask the PPC to consider geography as well? One of the things that I will point out, um, um, one of the vacancies did occur from Wichita, so we actually did have two individuals from Wichita. Yeah, but I'm not but, sure we should have, should we? Well, I do believe we should, given the, the fact that 11% of the uh, population is in Wichita. Uh -huh. And so, yes, to have a better vote, I, I, or not a better vote, to, have rep to represent that population, I do, do believe that that is in order. The thing that I was very concerned about is that um, um, given the challenges, there is no reason that these people should have to go through the process mm -hmm. all over again to be considered. Right, I get that. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's my point. Yeah. So to be clear, an opening comes up, one of these two people could fill the spot by job definition, they would still send it back to us for a vote? Yes. Okay, thank you. Dan. So, this is for clarification. Um, and then before we vote, I like an actual statement of what we are actually voting on. Um, If there's a position on the P end of this motion, if there's a position on the PPC that comes open for a public school teacher, because these are the positions we were talking about, to fill unexpired terms, not full terms, but unexpired terms, am I correct in that? That was yesterday, yeah. That was yesterday. So one of them comes up for expiration next summer. Is that... Is this the guys that that person that we just appointed yesterday cannot serve a full term at this point? Is that what we're voting on? All <coughs> we're saying is that the people that we did not approve yesterday, if mm -hmm. they do not have to reapply. Do not so it just keeps to, them in the hopper it keeps as them an in the option hopper. for the yes, board to yes. consider. That's all it is. And it also allows us to open up for other people to apply, well, correct? The final decision is ours. But it still opens it up, so it doesn't close the the application process to outside, correct? That's the way I understand the motion. Okay. I, I so why, I, okay. Do these, nom do these nominations just disappear then after yesterday? Are they like gone forever? In terms of practice, I just don't know. Yeah. I, I did not want to speak out of turn, sir. Um, if you would like the, we can keep those nominees, that information. We can save that in the folder for the next time we have an opening. And if they're the people that are nominated, we'd probably have to ha have them either re-nominated or they would need to indicate they still want it. Um, that's, that's not a problem. We could do that. No one's ever asked us to do that before. I don't know that I've ever had somebody nominated twice, but... It's been a minute. Uh, so I don't know exactly what the motion was, but to answer your question, do the nominees, do the nominations tend to die off and we don't, no, we don't keep record of those. We will, if, you, if that is the wish of the board, teacher licensure will keep those in the hopper and we'll ask them next time that that particular seat opens up, if they would like to be considered, then we'll, we'll put them back in the pile for consideration. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Melanie. 
I think that some of my questions have just been answered, but I'm now curious. There was a comment early on about the challenges in getting folks nominated in the first place and filling roles sometimes. And sometimes we, as board members, receive requests and are aware of a nomination process for any number of different committees, um, and the window may be small. So my question is, is there a challenge in lining up candidates for these positions? Yesterday we looked at four, and so the, the thought process here is two of those would now get thrown out and we're asking to just keep those on a list so that we can revisit them. There's a follow-up, but I'll pause and let you answer. There have been times that it has been um, like pulling teeth to get nominees in the right seats for the different commissions. Uh, sometimes it'll take uh, a few months longer than we would prefer. This time, in all candor, we've had these seats. We knew they were going to be open. There was some confusion as to which seats we needed. So that delay was on the agency. That was on me. Um, so I don't hate the idea of keeping the, these two non-appointed nominees uh, around next time we have an opening. Can you explain what you mean when you said get candidates in the right seats? Because I know that yesterday there was a comment about not wanting to double up from different districts or from the same district. So the, the in statute, and this is off memory, there are nine seats. You must have at least, and they're all public school individuals. You need a senior district administrator, you need a superintendent, and I believe you need a principal from a middle school, elementary school, and high school. I, I think maybe I said high school twice. And there are five teachers. Out of the five, you have to have at least one high school teacher, one middle school or junior high teacher, and one elementary school teacher. Currently, the seven people that we already have, we've worked that out to where we have all those positions, those determined ones, filled. That may not have been how they were originally appointed, uh, but they are in the seats now. So to be in compliance with state law, we've said, we just need two teachers. We don't care what level they're in, so long as they are a classroom teacher in a Kansas public school. Three years from now, four years from now, you may have a circumstance to where we have plenty of teachers, right? But we no longer have a high school teacher. So we would specifically need a high school teacher uh, so that's what I mean by getting people in the right seat, making sure we nominate and we appoint the right people. Thanks. Other boards, like the Professional Standards Board, I don't believe have those specific thou must be a high school teacher requirement. As for the, it was my request, it is not set in law, that we have diversity of school district. That was entirely my request just to avoid some problems we've had procedurally. Thank you. I think there might have been some confusion about that. Sure. Dan. And I kind of want to speak to that, and I have, uh, and then I would request the motion be read so we know what we're voting on. Um, my concern with having two people from, from 259, we already have one, which is, I think, appropriate. On a nine person board, you have two people from Wichita. If you have a case from USD 259, you have two people recused from the case, correct? I will say you would have two people that we would request to be recused. There have been times <coughs> that someone in the school district acknowledges, yes, we work in the same district. I don't know this person. I know nothing about the allegations. I don't know any of their witnesses. And, and they said, yeah, I can be a fair and impartial juror. Mm -hmm. So we allow them to stay on. But the request is almost always made, hey, will you at least consider mm -hmm. um, yeah. recusing yourself just for the image of impropriety? Because I guess my concern is when you have a nine-person board commission, then you have to have two people gone, then you have seven people making a decision. Yeah, but that's uh, not really related I, to this motion. I, I know, I know, but that yeah, I know, but that is a concern that I have, and um, in terms of that. So with that, may I have the motion as that we're voting on? And yeah, that's what I was request going to request as well is that we clarify: is it purely for yesterday's or moving forward that anything, how do we want this to, to the, be? The motion, as I understand it, Betty, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the people that we, that were on the list yesterday remain on the list without having to reapply. So just from yesterday. Yes. Is that, is that the intent of your yes. motion? Yes. 
Yeah, they don't have to be renominated, so they are basically in the queue uh, when they have a vac. And by the way, just editorially, I don't understand why anybody would want to be on this group. <laughs> so move to keep individuals approved or being considered for approval yesterday, active for placement in the future? Yeah. Move to keep them. I don't know that you couldn't, should you list the names? I was just going to ask if I may to clarify the intent is still that the you would still be the appointing body, yes, not yes. the PPC appointing their own members. Yes, that yes. Was my we still, it still has to come here, and we'll have this discussion again at that time. Thank you, sir. Everybody understand? All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? It looks like the motion carried. Thank you. Nine-one. Thank you. Who voted against it? Okay, okay. Now we're not on time. Jay. <laughs> uh, good morning to the board. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you the most recent recommendations from the ARC on system accreditation. Um, we have some for action, some for receive, and I just want to remind the board that these systems that are bringing forward to you today, their year five was last year, 21-22. So we're, we're not into this year yet. The uh, ARC will actually be meeting next week to consider the first round of year five systems for this year, okay? So, and I just wanna thank the board for their attention and appreciate the time that we had the last time the board retreat. I, I just I wanna rem remind the board of how adept you all are at a working lunch. We didn't even notice that you ate lunch. We just kept working. So uh, that, was a, that was a really good time uh, to talk through what we learned in the spring and then future, uh, future state for KISA. So we appreciate that time. So just a quick review of the process itself. It is still a five-year growth process to improve state board outcomes. It is in years one through four you are expected to have an outside visitation team that consists of a chair and at least two additional members. Those systems, uh, the systems have a yearly visit from the OVT and then they also have yearly system reports and OVT chair reports. In year five, what's added to that is the Accreditation Review Council reviews the documentation. Uh, they make a recommendation to the full ARC for action, a subcommittee does and then the ARC writes the executive summary and makes that recommendation that comes before you. The definitions for accreditation, um, we go through these every time. Uh, accredited is evidence of both process and growth and that system must be in compliance with all the state board uh, policies, compliance areas. Uh, conditionally accredited, it's insufficient evidence of either process or growth, so one or the other but that system also must remain in compliance. And then not accredited is insufficient evidence of both process and growth, or by itself, not in compliance with the State Board of Education. So these are the uh, kind of the resources that we point people towards when we're talking about those three factors, the growth in student performance, the process, and the compliance piece. So in October, there were three systems that came before the board as receive items. These systems were uh, 468 Healy. <coughs> and the, the ARC's recommendation for Healy is conditionally accredited. For Lawrence Gardner High School, conditionally accredited. And for Lake Mary Center, conditionally accredited. So those are slated for board action. Ann. Yeah, I'm going to ask a totally unfair question, but since we talked about it yesterday, about it's becoming really apparent that the need for literacy will help schools improve. So I'm wondering if when the ARC looks at results and they would see, for example, that ELA is not coming along, do they check to see if the district has moved to structured literacy like they're supposed to have? That's not part of the protocols. They may do that on their own, but that's not part of the, the protocol. Maybe they it would should look be for, I, I agree. I think they look for 
they look at the results first, and then they look for evidence in the documentation that the system provides of how they're addressing that. Right. So that may include strategies such as structured literacy. Um, but typically, if there is nothing listed that addresses that issue, that's going to be a cause for concern that the system will have to yeah, account but for. But we have a mandate now that they are to move to that. So I think if that's not part of their documentation, it ought to be. Thank you. Told you that wasn't fair, but anyway. It's okay. There yeah, we go. I agree that, that that needs to be a that needs to you need to consider that being a consideration. I believe, Betty. It's not a question. It's a more a comment. I'd like to take the opportunity to <coughs> thank you because it's not too often that um, we we allow people to voice their concerns and then. Resp I shouldn't say allow them to voice. Let me let me rephrase that. Respond to the concerns that they've mentioned. I do feel that moving forward, this is the best way that we can um, produce the 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 equity that we need when stakeholders have a voice in what what their issues are, what their concerns are, and the fact that. We see such a great response in in uh, responding to those issues that they are having. So I really want to congratulate you on the thought process that was given, the actual time that you spent documenting uh, the changes or the challenges that districts were facing. Um, that's just uh, an opportunity publicly to say thank you for what you did on this. Appreciate that. Thank you. And now I believe a, a, a motion would be in order. Okay. On item six. Item yeah. six. It is moved, I move that the Kansas State Board of Education accept the recommendations of the Accreditation <coughs> Review Council and award the status of conditionally accredited to USD 468 Healy, SO 521 Lawrence Gardner High, and Z032 4727 Lake Mary Center. Is there a second to that motion? Jim McNeese seconds that motion. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously, and I believe you're next on the agenda <laughs> still. <laughs> yes. And I just a quick follow up. Sarah reminded me that. Dyslexia is a mandate, structured literacy is a mandate, so that's part of the compliance part of KISA, so they have to, they do have to stay in compliance with that, just yeah, as I'm, a clarification. I'm just not sure a lot of them have done that yet, so thank you. So the systems to receive, uh, Atchison County, uh, full accredited is the recommendation from the ARC, and then accelerated schools. What we had was, uh, Initially, they were conditionally accredited by the ARC. Accelerated schools appealed that. The documentation they provided in that appeal answered the area for improvement that the ARC identified. So then the ARC uh, recommended them to be fully accredited. But in the meantime, we found that there was a data discrepancy, a rather large data discrepancy, where the system accelerated schools actually reported a post-secondary effectiveness rate that was a local measure, a locally derived measure. They did not look at their public report uh, on, as far as post-secondary effectiveness, and there's a drastic difference between what the system reported and what's on the accountability report. So we are wanting to pull that back to the ARC for further review so that we can have a, a better picture of everything about accelerated schools and their accreditation. So in that case, next month, we would only be voting on Atchison County. Correct. Is that correct? Any questions? Well, since, is, since there are no questions and this is a receive item, we are now ahead of schedule again. I was going to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Beth, it's all yours. Thank you, Chairman Porter, Commissioner Watson, state board members. I'm sure the guests that I'm going to uh, 
uh, that I'm bringing to you today. We'll be happy to hear you're ahead of schedule because they have uh, a lot of conversation. So at this time, I'm going to, I want to introduce to you a familiar face. Her name is uh, Mrs. Natalie Clark. She's a veteran teacher in Kansas. She uh, was our business career and technical education consultant for several years and a very, very strong advocate for career and technical education. I want to introduce her today as our new assistant director on uh, career standards and assessment services, and she will be starting in January. So I'm going to let Natalie introduce our guests. And you forgot to say that she's the former queen mother. <laughs> I did. I could. I know. <laughs> Thank you, Beth, and thanks for having us today, Chair Porter, um, board members, Commissioner Watson. Happy to be here. Um, I'm very happy. As you know, we started a work-based learning pilot in January of 2020. It was the recommendation of the Governor's Council on Education to provide equitable access to high-quality work-based learning wherever a student resides in Kansas. So since January of 2020, we have had pilots. We have had three um, versions of pilots that have gone, gone through. It was cross-agency work, and I want to thank um, the Department of Commerce. Mike Bean was our partner, along with the workforce boards and the executive directors of the workforce centers that you're going to meet here shortly. We also partnered with the Board of Regents. With Scott Smathers was our contact, as well as the Department of Labor. So we learned a lot from those pilots. We learned about what is going on in the different departments that can provide resources to school districts, and how can work-based learning intermediaries that were housed at the workforce boards and workforce centers act as that liaison with business and industry and economic development. So I appreciate, I have gotten the opportunity to work with Keith Lawing um, since prior to January of 2020, um, but certainly through the pilot, as well as Deb Scheibler, who you're going to meet from Region 1, but they're going to tell you a little bit about what they accomplished during the pilot and then what we can look forward to because now it is a work-based learning intermediary initiative. So they will not be just working with pilot schools since the pilot phase is over. They have the opportunity to work with all schools in each of the regions and they're gonna tell you how that will work in each of those regions. So Keith Lawing is the executive director of Area 4 Workforce Alliance of South Central Kansas he is also the, on the Governor's Council, he is the work-based learning co-chair. So it's my privilege to get to introduce Keith, who will in turn introduce the other executive directors of the local area workforce centers that are here today. Thank you and welcome, Keith. Good morning, Chairman Potter and board members. It's a pleasure to be here today. And Natalie, thank you very much for the introduction. I'd like to have my colleagues kind of step forward and have my back here a little bit. So uh, we're all here today to make some remarks and then to answer some questions uh, that you would have. But uh, with me today from Local Area 1 is Deb Scheibler. Um, and with us today from Local Area 2 here in Topeka area is Gina Kaufman. Um, my counterpart, uh, Keely Schneider from the Workforce Partnership in Kansas City will follow my remarks to uh, go over some numbers we have today. Our colleague from Southeast Kansas, Leanne Cars, was not able to join us, but we wanted to demonstrate to the board the commitment we have for this project and the importance this project has. So we thought it was important for all of us to be here today. Um, <clears throat> I want to briefly give you an, uh, just kind of an overview about our system. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, as Natalie mentioned, we're the five workforce development boards in the state of Kansas. We manage primarily federal job training dollars that come to the state through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And then through that, we operate a network of workforce centers uh, throughout the region. Our primary state partner is the Kansas Department of Commerce, and we help administer and promote the Kansas work system. Uh, we view employers as our primary customer. Um, and certainly uh, the job seekers, the students are there as well, but we will not do an adequate job on serving our business and or serving our, our job seekers and the students if we don't understand the needs of business and industry. So we take a very demand driven approach when it comes to uh, skills needs, uh, job postings and education. So just to connect a few dots here for you, um, I was <clears throat> had the opportunity to present to this board a couple of years ago uh, with Textron Aviation about a high school internship program. 
uh, this is one of the catalysts and this is one of the dots I, I wanted to connect with for you all as to why we are here today and how we got here today. Um, <clears throat> but we've been doing summer youth employment down in the Wichita area for some time. And when we would talk to the businesses about providing a summer internship, what they wanted to know was, well, what's the young person studying? You know, if we're going to provide an internship, we'd like to do it with a student that's interested in our profession, leaning this way. So we really partnered strongly with all the school districts um, and been growing that, that piece of it. Um, actually, in this conversation, in some ways, goes predates that. I think the first time I met Commissioner Watson was over 10 years ago when he was at McPherson, and he was interested then in how do we do better alignments with our education system and our job training system. And then, as Natalie mentioned, I had the opportunity to serve on the Governor's Education Council, and, and that's where these conversations really started to take fruition. Um, you know, how do you help a young person uh, make career choices? And a lot of times you do that directly with these work-based learning opportunities and internships. And we've seen data uh, that shows that students who get these kind of opportunities have greater academic outcomes, stronger lifetime learnings. And the other thing, we're looking at a stickiness element. Um, it's been well documented that Kansas does a great job of educating our young people, both in our K through 12 system and our post-secondary system and then those students choose to leave to go find other economic opportunities. We feel that by exposing young people in high school to career opportunities in their communities and in this state, and then how you achieve those education and those skills needed to get those jobs, that can help keep some of these students here. So there's several different elements <coughs> of what we are uh, trying to bring to the table through this program. And what we have, and just a little memo to anybody in particular, um, <clears throat> do not start a pilot project at the very beginning of a global pandemic. A um, little tough, and, and we weren't sure where this thing was going for the first year. Uh, so I really want to express my appreciation <clears throat> to the, the Department of Education, Department of Commerce, and all of our colleagues for sticking with this. Um, and so if I could, am I controlling the slides here, Natalie? Can, let me jump to the next slide. Perfect. Um, uh, I guess I'm going to rain on Keeley's parade, so I don't want to go there yet. But uh, the first year, it was funded through Perkins dollars. So we used some, some reserves from Perkins to help support this project. The second year, uh, we got funding through the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Um, and we weren't even sure if there was going to be a second year, but, but we were able to generate some outcomes. We produced some results that warranted that second year. For this third year, uh, for the first time ever, the Kansas legislature put state funding into this program and provided those dollars to the local workforce boards. So the workforce boards have been able to hire staff that have been able to work directly with the school districts. Uh, these are work-based learning intermediaries. And what's different for us is even though we have youth training dollars through the federal government, through our WIOA funds, that is primarily for out-of-school youth. So it limits our ability to be in the classroom, to be in the schools. This funding allows us to do that. And then the other piece of it, we're actually able to leverage the federally funded job training system with the investments the state is making in education, both at the K through 12 level and at the post-secondary level. So it gives us better outcomes and again, brings those systems together to create much clearer pathways uh, from education to employment. Um, so we're very excited about that. I, I'm going to bring my colleague up, Keely Schneider, and she's going to go over some of these numbers we have on the PowerPoint to talk about the results that we've been generating uh, for this last year and where we are going this current year, and then all of us are here willing and able to answer any questions that the board has. Uh, Keely? Keith, thank you, and good morning to the board. I'm Keely Schneider. I'm the Executive Director for Workforce Partnership, and we are the local board that serves Johnson, Wyandotte, and Leavenworth counties on the Kansas side of the metro um, in Kansas City. And so um, what I'm going to do is walk you through some of our data points. Um, this is the 2021 21, 2022 school year. So this is the second year of the pilot. And I will um, remind you all, these numbers that you're going to see are what we did across the entire state, all five work for, workforce boards combined. And we did this with each of us having only a single staff person to do the work. And so I think that's quite tremendous. So last year's results, we served 46,000 students across the state. 
they were engaged in some type of work-based learning experience, and I'll dig into what those look like in a minute. We engaged 516 employers, and those employers were directly engaged with our school districts. And as you can see, we had 101 schools participating across 28 school districts. So very, very proud of that work last year. And how that breaks down, breaks down is this, as you all well are aware of the three sort of, uh, the continuum, I'll call it, of work-based learning experience begins with awareness. And then it goes into more exploration and then finally into true career preparation. So we have divided the way we approach uh, the work-based learning initiative in a similar fashion. And so as you can see, last year we had 28,000 or over 28,000 students who were engaged in career awareness ex experiences. So largely these are young people in elementary school, although that does flow into middle and high school as well. Um, and these types of experiences are going to be uh, your guest speakers, your field trips, career fairs. Um, of course, during pandemic time, we did a lot of virtual events um, and then some employer tours, that type of, of general awareness of what is out there beyond what they perhaps know personally, maybe what mom or dad or you know, family members do and so on. And then as you move into uh, a little bit more career exploration and you go a little deeper into those areas that perhaps a young person is interested in, we were able to provide 9,169 students with a career exploration experience. That gets a little more into digging into the details of a particular career. So that is looking at job shadows, perhaps mock interviews or informational interviews that students will do with individuals in a particular career, perhaps career mentoring. And again, we can throw in those field trips and employer tours as well. And then as you move really into your high school space and your older students, they need to be in career preparation experiences. And we're proud to have provided 8,861 students with that type of experience. And here is where you're really going to start digging in deep and having true work experience combined with that educational component. That will be internships, clinical rotations, various types of work experiences, short term, maybe longer term over the summer, registered apprenticeship programs for youth or perhaps pre-apprenticeship programs. You will also see some employer connected projects, entrepreneurship and so on. So very happy to see these numbers in a year where we only had five staff members and now with additional funds for this current school year, we are able to double um, the number of staff people we have working across the state. There are a few testimonials there. I'm not going to read them all to you, um, but I think it's really important to look here at Mr. Trenton Tharp. He is um, a young man. He said, I loved it. I got to clean headlights and got some real world vehicle experience. I would recommend work experience to help students further their career goals. And he's a 2023 um, uh, candidate for, for graduation. So we're, we're excited and there he is there smiling and thumbs up. Um, but it, it really is, is so important. I, I love this, um, this uh, quote saying, work-based learning provides students with an experience they simply cannot get in the classroom. And that is so true. It is something that is unique and um, supplements. And there are the school districts that were involved across the state. And like I said, within that 101 schools. And then here, of course, our partners. These are all the workforce boards, of course, the Department of Education. And um, we also have our uh, uh, Kansas Works program, at, program helping as well. So I wanted to provide a tiny bit of color commentary um, on a couple things that we've been doing in um, our local area, just to show you the breadth and depth of, of the different types of experiences. So for example, and these are two from this year, um, these are not last year's. So this year with the Piper School District, we held a career exploration experience um, for the entire district. Now Piper's a pretty small school district, so we, we had everyone involved. There were 250 students who who, um, who came to the, to the experience and it was over an evening time. They brought their families and so on. And what it was done, what we did was we set up um, experience 
experiences both for the very, very young individuals who were there, as well as our you know, middle and high school students. And we had 50 employers come in, set up tables. They were there to educate. They were there not to sell a job, but to really educate on the career. So students walked around, got information. Uh, we had um, all kinds of uh, fun things out in the parking lot for our younger kids. We had um, our employers bring uh, trucks, and I know that sounds kind of strange, but it was called Touch a Truck. And so we had a lot of young people out there, not just with your obligatory police vehicles and, uh, and you know, ambulance or fire trucks, but we had cement mixers, and we had cherry pickers, and we had these, um, uh, these employers out there by their trucks explaining what the trucks did, how they worked, the kids got to crawl all over them. So this is the type of engagement we're talking about when we're talking about young people, explaining what, what does a, a truck do when it's sucking out the sewage out of, out of different sewer areas. It's a really fascinating truck, I'll be honest, I saw it. Um, so we have experiences like that, but we also had things there for our older students. Um, we had Garmin there showing some of their very, very high-tech equipment and explaining to students how they can take their kinetic energy from uh, a, a bicycle, a stationary bicycle, and turn that into um, energy that can be used. So we had a lot of those types of things. That's a career ex exploration and awareness experience. Then you take it to the completely opposite side of that is work we're doing right now with Quest Diagnostics. Uh, the Kansas City area has a high location quotient in uh, biotech, biomanufacturing, and so on. Quest Diagnostics is part of that um, industry. And we've done a few things with Quest here this year. We've been offering teacher externships, allowing teachers to go into Quest and to learn from the employer directly what those skills are that their students need to understand if they want to go into a technical area in biomedical, biomanufacturing, they can start to understand the skills that are needed by doing these tours and talking directly with people who are working in the laboratory. So that's one thing. We also are setting up a client connected project um, for the DeSoto School District and Quest is going to essentially hand a classroom a project around laboratory testing and they're going to do it for the employer and then prevent, present the results back to uh, people at Quest. So that's a very exciting experience. And then the last one has taken a lot of work, but once they're 18, Quest has said you can apply for an internship with us. They do have an 18-year-old requirement. And then from that, students may enroll in an accelerated three-year bachelor's degree program, all online, paid for by Quest, that starts at Johnson County Community College and finishes at St. Louis University. That's the type of in-depth work we're trying to do with our employers as our students get older. So I also wanna um, allow my other colleagues to share some of their individual experiences and some of their um, uh, preparation work that they're doing. In well, their th thank you for if your- If you want to. Thank you for your presentation. We're gonna pass on the sewage demonstration today. Yeah. <laughs> I cover the 62 counties in western Kansas. Um, so ours, ours is going to look a little bit different than Johnson County and, and the Area 3 area because we're going into schools where so oftentimes I'm in a meeting with a superintendent and they have to take a break to go serve lunch. Um, so we really are that extended opportunity for some of our smaller, smaller districts. Districts have done some great things. Building Bridges um, is a fantastic project where we bring the community in to the schools to learn about what's happening inside the community and how they can support the schools. Um, and we get volunteers from, from the employers uh, that way to help us um, extend these opportunities for the students in their communities. Anatomy of a building is fantastic. It's similar to some of the things that um, Keely and Keith were talking about. We um, had some uh, uh, of our employers that are building a building bring out kids so they could see how it starts from the ground um, and builds it all the way up. And they followed it throughout the year as they were able to see that um, grow. But um, it, this is a fantastic opportunity for us. We have 14,000 jobs available in Western Kansas at any one time, and they're good jobs, um, but we don't have enough people to do that. Our best recruiting field is inside our high schools, making sure they know the jobs that are available in their communities um, so that they, if they do go off to school, they come back. Or if they don't have to go, go off to school, they stay um, and, and you know join the legacy of their small town communities too. So uh, with that, Gina, you wanna add anything? Yeah, I'm gonna 
Gina Compton, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to visit with you about this great program. Um, I am similar to uh, Deb. I have some of uh, some small rural schools. I am in. I represent uh, local area two, so the 17 counties surrounding the um, Douglas County, all the way to uh, Junction City, Gary County areas. So. During the pilot program, we worked with some of the smaller schools who didn't have a lot of resources to really explore um, what it takes to interview and be prepared for a job. So our work-based learning intermediary went out and visited with schools about workplace preparedness and what it would entail. And then after that, we had job fairs that we invited uh, the students to attend an hour before uh, it was open to the public for other individuals. And we gave them some in-depth knowledge on what to, what questions to ask, um, how to explore opportunities when you're looking at an employer that maybe isn't of interest in you, but uh, to you in your future, but what else, um, if you wanted to be an accountant and you're working at a manufacturing plant, you're, you wouldn't be placed there, but to really explore and ask in-depth questions. And employers came up to us afterwards and were really impressed with how prepared the students were. So that was really good. We also have um, smaller uh, schools uh, where we want them or they want to stay in their area of home where they grew up, but they don't see opportunities for them. So we had a lot of our career explorations to go out into those individual markets where we had manufacturers such as um, Caterpillar and local areas there. We also had um, an opportunity this year to expand. Uh, we have schools that are reaching out to us saying, hey, we were at a, a career and we were talking to another school and you came out and talked to us. We want them to, we want you to come talk to us as well. And uh, we are exploring opportunities now. We have bought, just purchased some virtual reality equipment, trying to uh, reach middle and high school students and uh, giving them an opportunity to learn what it's like to be a welder. Uh, virtually, and they've been very excited about that as well. So we look forward to this next year where we can expand and go into more schools than where we had an opportunity last year. Thank you. Thank you. We know we're, <clears throat> I think, the last thing between you and break. So um, I, the one example I'll bring up uh, is we're very intentionally working right now with a group of employers in the engineering fields and also financial services to create some internships for this upcoming school year, uh, for uh, the spring semester in particular, um, and be very deliberate about that. You know, in the Wichita area, av aviation is king. We are the air capital of the world. So we're being intentional to take the things that have really worked well in the aviation industry around this model and applying that into some other areas of a career interest uh, where we see our young people. Um, so again, we just really appreciate the opportunity here, Mr. Chairman, happy to answer any questions. Uh, we also are, we'll continue to provide data um, as Keeley, the numbers Keeley was presented, that was from the last school year, we're very actively collecting data on a quarterly basis. We'll be providing that to Natalie, really looking forward to working with Natalie on this project. And again, happy to answer any questions you, Mr. Chairman, or the board would have okay, for us. Thank you, Betty. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'm kind of curious, what tools do you use to match students with uh, potential um, um, career employers? And I ask that because you probably know individualized plan of study in our schools and the Zell program trying to get an idea of, of where their potential may lie. Do you use a tool such as that? Yes, very much so. In fact, part of the way this program works is that the workforce boards, we have our work-based learning intermediaries. The schools have a coordinator assigned to that. And so we intentionally leverage just the kind of uh, products you're talking about, whether it's Zello or another uh, career exploration tool, and, and we use that to match those, those career interests up. Um, you know, and a lot of times working directly with the schools. So I heard an example the other day. Uh, you know, artist was the career field for some young person. So it was like, what other, is that graphic design? I mean, what, what would else apply to that? Or a lot of our young people, they want to be athletes or, you know, so what is the business of going into sports if you're not an athlete? So yes, we very much use those tools that are in the school districts uh, to help coordinate the activities that we offer. Okay, and, and just one other follow-up, if I, if I may. Um, 
I'm always kind of curious how you market this. There are so many great opportunities available. And I'm amazed from time to time when I'm talking to people and there's this look of, what? what? <laughs> and and, and it, that kind of concerns me. So how do you uh, market this program and, and, and reach your intended audience of, of students that might be interested? Well, it's it's very much a grassroots oriented campaign. Um, we work directly with the schools, with the counselors, with the teachers, uh, with business groups. I mean, um, you know, I know each of my colleagues, uh, we've reached out to our local chambers of commerce because a lot of times a business is interested in getting into this space. They don't know who to call. Do you just call the local school? Do you call the principal? Do you call the district office? Um, and so a lot of it's just really raising awareness, like I said, in a very grassroots level. So businesses know if they're interested in engaging in schools, they can work through the workforce boards, um, teachers uh, in terms of getting to their students and in their classes. And that's another thing that we bring to the table uh, as partners in this entity, because each of us have a board of directors that is made up of local business leaders. Um, and so right there, we've got an internal network in place that helps us get the word out, certainly through the business community, that this opportunity is available and invite those employers forward to help us create these opportunities for young people. Thank you. Diane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you, Keith. I, I knew your dad. I did a lot of legwork for him on a voter ID <laughs> lawsuit, I think, one time. Anyway, he was a great guy. Thank you very much. Um, so one of the things that comes up a lot, I know when we went to, uh, Melanie and I went to CompuCon a year ago or so, Alan Cobb was there from the State Chamber of Commerce, and he said the number one th concern of his chamber members was that our high school kids didn't have enough of these soft skills, work skills that, that they needed. They were fine academically, but they needed them to have all those skills that were on our competency wheel, which we'd been saying, so it was really nice to have the state chamber guy echoing that. But I'm wondering if that's what you're hearing from your employers as well, and how we're helping deliver those, those skills for success. Most definitely, um, and we do actually, uh, Allen and the Kansas Chamber are partners in this entity, and we've heard that, and I saw some of my colleagues shaking their heads, we've been hearing that for, and that's one of the reasons we're in this space, yeah. because what we try to design with these opportunities for these young people is to treat it like a job, and to demonstrate, this is where you learn the soft skills, you can talk to people about the soft skills, you can tell them this is what you should do, but you have to experience it, and I heard one of my board members say, describe this as a safe way to fail because if mm -hmm. that young person does not show up, does not follow through, they will be fired, so to speak. I mean, you know, we, we try to build some, some consequences into not following through. For example, we do a career camp over the summer for 14 and 15 year olds that's tied to this project. The young people have to treat it like a job. They have to apply. They have to show up on time. They can't no call, no show. We've literally fired young people from that opportunity. And again, I don't, it's not my goal, but not, so the consequence is then witnessed. And so that's part of what we're really trying to do. And again, create a, an atmosphere where they can see what a workplace actually looks like. They can experience that. So some of that comes through. Really, it is, it is a deliberate part of this strategy and why we are doing this project. Okay, and I was interested in the, if it's okay, the funding stream evolution, I guess, if you will. So the state put in, was it 750000 you know, this year? I have to remember. defer to Natalie. I do not know what the first year allocation was, but I know that was a, a smaller amount because what it funded was one staff person to each of the five local areas. And, and that was the same amount from the second year. And it was this third year that increased the dollar amount. And in the budget line, I'm a little over $700,000. Okay. And so that is in Department of Commerce's budget. Gotcha. Uh, and so that is the funding that uh, allowed us to increase our staffing and hire an extra and uh, intermediary. Those are the names of the people we saw. They're all on board now, the new intermediaries. The, yeah, the yeah, state yeah. Funded. well, uh, we're still uh, like any pilot. I mean, I, you know, we're having some personnel issues. We've had a little bit of turnover, got a couple of open positions, but no, all of the, the intermediaries are either in place or there's intermediary activity that's currently being covered right now by some existing staff. So, um, but I do believe, yeah, we've had some, I've had some turnover in my local area. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, I would say, a great job market these days. So people are. Yeah. And just one more, if that's okay. I know we're going to have the ACT people up later, but I'm a big work keys 
Oh, yeah. You know, cheerleader, I guess, for lack of a better word. I probably couldn't pass it. But anyway, um, I'm wondering if you guys work with ACT and Work Keys to use their assessments in yeah, your Yeah, we, we all of us offer learning. the Work Ready Credential, ACT-based testing, as a pre-employment tool uh, through our system. So we very much tied into that. And just to take this a step further, with um, a lot of this is engineered in order to get young people to understand what they need to do academically to achieve career goals. So we are certainly going to be preparing them. If, if you're going on to college, you need to take these kind of testing uh, to be ready for that and to understand that, that demonstrating they actually have the skills and education as part of the process. So. so if we had every kid taking work keys, that wouldn't be a bad thing. I don't think it would be a bad thing at all. Um, you know, the challenge, and this is something we could talk to Mr. Cobb at the chamber about, but I think more businesses need to recognize uh, the work keys assessment. I know we have companies in my local area, Spirit Aero Systems, for example, they've actually used that as a formal part of their hiring process for production workers. They've mm -hmm. made it a requirement. Um, and if more employers used it, to your point, it would be much more relevant for high school yeah. students to go through and get, get that, that credential. Chicken and egg thing. The yeah. Employers don't want to use it because kids aren't taking it, and kids don't take it because employers aren't using it. But I've been pitching that the best reason to do work keys is that as an 11th grader, you can get into that database of 20 some thousand careers, whether you know, no matter what it is, and figure out in 11th grade if you've taking the right courses to get there. So to me, it's an IPS direct tie-in, but thank you for that. that. Deb, you want to, Deb? Yep. Deb. One of the services that we've done for some of our schools is actually go out and talk to the group that's going to take the work keys test mm -hmm. before oh, to nice. explain why it's important. It's not just their state testing. You know, this is, this is a big deal. This is going to tie to the jobs that they want and that, that type of thing, and the schools that we've done that for <coughs> has seen an increase in um, higher higher scores. Cool, because we'd certainly like to get this whole thing up more than 28 districts. Right. I'm a little embarrassed that my own local district doesn't do much with internships. Yeah, or has but like if they're no going to sit down and take this very long three-hour test, they need to know why it's important. <laughs> what's what's you know what are the results going to show? We've even gone out and helped prepare. Um, the, te the the results and deliver the results and kind of made a big deal out of it, giving them away, you know. Um, a lot of our kids maybe haven't gotten a certificate like this before, so we've kind of done that a little bit too, and that's been very well received by the students and the schools. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Thank you. One more question, and then we're going to have to move on. Michelle. Okay, thank you, Chairman Porter. Um, going to be a little bit of the elephant in the room. Um, a lot of the stuff you're talking about um, here today, I did – at the University of Iowa in college under my own dime. I paid for that. It was in my fourth year of college. Um, got that work, work experience. I had, up to that, I had lots of um, part-time jobs, uh, full-time jobs, uh, you know, where it took a lot of summer hours, where I worked a lot of, had a lot of experiences. Um, jobs are nice, I'll say this, um, but this is not, is this not transforming education to training for the workforce? I'm sorry, say that last part. Is this, because K through K through 12, I see as education. Yes. Um, this is, this sounds like more like training. Like, so as far as my, my own son, um, working with Naviance, I know there's Zello out there. Um, as far as the, the data that's being collected on the kids for that, when they're doing those programs, um, and, and getting them into an area where they, they've just, they just wrote something down. And then it's like creating that, like, I'll just use this as an example. My son put down, he didn't know what to put down, so he put down engineer. And then all of a sudden, everything that was being directed towards him and different assessments and things were gearing him towards, towards, that, towards that type of line of work. He took his freshman class and didn't like any of that. He's in, he's in accounting now and finance yeah. at a university. Um, so I'm thinking education is like for life, life um, liberty and the pursuit of happiness for the individual. Um, so when we're we're talking about education, how and, and workforce and, and and different people coming in and and saying you know this is these are opportunities for you and how is how is like even like teacher licensure how is that going to be working around we're focusing on this younger and younger like in eighth grade this should be something that maybe you're talking about their senior year and then you, you're going on with those passions beyond that in college community college paying for that on your own dime like I did for four years going to college. 
not not because who's paying for all, all of this? Like you talked about Quest Diagnostics, they have um, they had a, they have internships or they're paying for these things. We're gearing them towards instead of going out and getting these part-time jobs, getting these experience. You say, well, we're firing them. Well, you would get fired in a business too, and a local business may not. You might have 174 businesses across Kansas taking part in this ACT work keys. Which, and I asked this, I think, a couple years ago, which may, some businesses may not part, want to participate in that. Um, we have people um, at the local districts, um, in, in my local districts, we can opt out of ACT work keys. I don't have to do that for my, my son. We don't have to have those data points. We don't have to have the Zello. We don't have to have Naviance. We just work with what, family and counseling, counselors, and we, and we do this with our own family. So I guess I'm trying to figure out, is, are we working on education from K through 12, which we're the Department of Education, or are we working more towards workforce-based training based on what the employers want out there and not based on what the individual wants? Because we're moving towards, we're working towards our stakeholders and our employers rather than the individual. And my, that's what I see from all this. Well, I guess what I see, and let me try to give you a response, um, this is part of the education process. Because you're at, you know, the reason, again, this, you know, for education is to help prepare you for the future. And this is one way to expose students of what a potential future is uh, in their local communities with business and industry. You know, I used to ask, why am I, do I have to study algebra when I'm in seventh grade? This is part of trying to answer that question because if you have a job one of these days, you're going to have to know math. This is the kind of job where you need to learn math. And the goal is not to pigeonhole kids at an early age in seventh or eighth grade and say, here's the one career path because you filled out an assessment and we're going to keep you on here. It's for exposure. Um, you know, one quick antidote I would say, and, and, and before I go to my antidote, we're also responding to the business community asking us, can you help get us into the classrooms? Can you help us work with schools so we can better educate young people so they will have those skills that we need in order to grow our businesses in Kansas so we can try to keep those young people here? Um, and the antidote I would say that, uh, to back this up a little bit is uh, at our Textron actual internship, uh, after the summer internship was over, met with a couple of students and I said, well, what'd you think? Well, the first student said, oh, this was great. I didn't really know what Textron did. Now I know I talked to my supervisor. I graduate from high school next year. They're going to hire me back. They have a tuition reimbursement program and they're going to pay for my college. Then I talked to another student, he said, you know, I didn't really like this very much. I, I'm not into aviation, you know, and I'm probably not going to pursue engineering. I'm going to go into finance. So part of it, I, I think, is exposure to young people as part of an education process so they can see the options out there and then they can help choose what career option or what passion they have. Okay, my concern is, you talked about algebra, my concern is with education, we need to still be keeping our standards high with our teachers and make sure they can teach the algebra. We're moving, to, we're moving to online math, we're uh, fuzzy math, I want to call it. I mean, some of the math that, we're, that our children are be exposed to is not the arithmetic that even my parents learned back in, back in the day. And they graduated, you know, my mom graduated from college, but my father did not. He went to barbering school, but he, boy, he had those key skills. He knew arithmetic, he knew how to read, he knew the basic foundational pieces of education. That We have kids now that say, I got this IPS and now I can be a welder. And the mom's like, well, you're in ninth grade, you can't barely read and you can barely do math. You need to have those foundational skills and you need to have the good quality teachers in the school before we move on to workforce training. That's what I'm trying to say. I want a welder with a high education that, that be able to be well-rounded and go out there and be able to do, because they might want to move on to, every kid in Kansas should be able to pick, be picked from an employer and say, we've got some really highly educated kids out there. And that's what she was saying. But... They don't have these skills. Well, are they do uh, have they have part time jobs? I mean, a lot of the kids are in sports. We kind of moved on to sports, and that's been more important than than earning money, uh, as far as a part time job. But I still want those kids to graduate from with a diploma to be able to uh, fluency in reading, math, arithmetic, and math uh, as the foundation, and then they can get other you know personal finance. They can take biology, chemistry, physics, all that stuff that's a little bit higher in the higher ages. But I just want to make sure that we're not. We're, we're having kids that are now getting in 8th grade and ninth grade, not reading very well, not doing math very well, but boy, they're excited about being a welder. I no, mean, that, I, we're hearing that. We are hearing I, that in Kansas right now. So I just want to make sure we're going younger and younger. And some of these things, I feel like, get through the educational piece first and then focus on, the, on, the, on, the, on these other things that could happen in 11th and 12th grade. Well, I appreciate your concerns, and I do not see where this work-based learning initiative 
um, interferes with education standards. Uh, you know, in fact, I, I would say that it should complement the education standards and would actually uh, help uh, achievement and goals in the long run. Um, and that's how we want to try to administer and, and, and manage and partner with the school districts. Thank you. Thank you very much. I suppose I'll see you at the Governor's Council tomorrow. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. Thank Appreciate you. the opportunity today. And, and finally, just say, we, we all of us, thank you for your service to the state of Kansas. Uh, we know this is quite a commitment. I've seen your agenda today. I know uh, what it takes to serve in this kind of capacity. And we all thank you very much for your service. Thank you for the opportunity, too. We will reconvene at 5 minutes till 11.
up again. Go ahead. I am. I, it's always my honor to come uh, and share with you um, when I have the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Chairman Porter, Commissioner, and State Board members. Uh, we're going to move uh, just a little bit away from the work uh, work. Uh, based learning that you heard about before break. Uh, it's very critical and important to our work um, in Kansas education. And then talk about uh, the ACT. We've been fortunate for the last few years that the legislature's provided funding to offer the opportunity for all students in Kansas, all um, high school students. Uh, we've limited uh, eight, uh, with ACT 11th grade, we offer that in the spring for all, all students to have that opportunity to take the test. And then with the work keys, we offer that in the fall and a student has the opportunity to take it in either uh, tenth, in 11th or 12th grade. So um, that's just the background of, of how we've um, tried to move this opportunity um, available to all students. I will say that um, the, the dates and the timing are fairly strategically placed for that opportunity, students um, taking that ACT in 11th grade then have an opportunity to retest and raise their scores if they're interested, and ACT provides opportunities uh, so that it can be equitable for all students if the districts choose to take advantage of it. And with work keys, the nice thing about work keys is that um, it's offered either at the junior or senior year, and then they can also retake parts of the work keys if they want to have a higher level certificate on that. So um, I can certainly talk to you about um, results and just state opportunities at, at a later date, but today um, it's my pleasure to have uh, Mr. Uh, Coleco Oligo here to visit with you about our, our state initiative with ACT. Um, and I, hopefully I'm not insulting you, but we've known each other for so long, we're on a first name basis, so I usually just refer to him as Coleco, and I, I feel uh, confident that he would uh, be comfortable if you referred to him that way too when you were asking questions. Uh, Coleco's worked with Kansas for many, many years. He has worked with the agency. Uh, prior to the contract we have to provide the opportunity to all students, making sure that districts that had previously wanted to provide that opportunity could do that. Uh, he comes um, annually to share uh, results with us, and he's available for all different types of support. Um, he is the uh, Senior Director of State and Federal Programs, and he has made sure, as we implemented ACT uh, for a statewide opportunity, that it runs as seamless as our state assessment program. And so, when we have help desk issues, he's the, the go-to guy I call and say, we, ha we have to get this um, fixed. And so, he's, he's been very helpful, very willing, uh, worked very hard. He's a great listener. He's an advocate uh, for what's best for our students in Kansas and for Kansas education. So, with that, I'll turn it over to Clico to share a presentation with you today. And welcome to the State Board of Education. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Randy, <laughs> members of the State Board, I am honored to be here uh, to present to you uh, an update of not just our support, but the consideration of looking at the ACT assessments, uh, being the ACT as off the shelf, the ACT work keys as off the shelf. And by the end of this presentation, uh, I want you to have an understanding of where we're at in terms of supporting KSDE with this initiative. Uh, I also want you to have an understanding of where other states are in using the ACT. But of course, I have to say I apologize that it took so long for me to come back as there were other limiters to the uh, country in terms of travel. As I believe the last time I was in front of you, it was January 15th, 2020, when we spoke about the hierarchy of uh, readiness in terms of a college pathway as well as a career pathway. And so to catch us up to where we left off, we were very in line with college readiness and career readiness. And in terms of exploring career readiness in terms of that hierarchical framework, looking at career ready, what does it mean to be employed? As we mentioned, the 22,000 jobs we've profiled, 
What does it mean to have some sort of career pathway to advise a student from their knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics, which would be motivation, grit, uh, and understanding of that career pathway down to the legislative level, the standards level. And so as we go through our PowerPoint, I first want to start with states and their overview as to how they're using our assessments for ESSA accountability. First, when we take a step back and look at our nation, 15 states are using the ACT uh, in terms of a state-funded uh, mandate. Those states are delivering the ACT on a weekday, very similar to the state of Kansas. We have what's called an optional or choice testing model. As you notice, the large uh, nations of Texas and Florida have certainly uh, increased the number of students taking a college entrance exam. Uh, roughly about 1.3 million students took the ACT in 2022. Much of those students came from state testing opportunities within the 15 as well as eight tested states. When we look at states in terms of using the ACT for federal accountability, I am just speaking about the ACT assessment as it stands off the shelf, meaning no augmentation. This is a nationally recognized assessment that when a student sits for the ACT, they receive a nationally recognized score for scholarships, admissions, as well as placement into college core coursework. Because I believe that has been a misconception that college entrance exams are only for entrance. And so when we look at this uh, table, we're noticing roughly nine states, and I say roughly because we're continuing to have conversations like we are here in Kansas on using the ACT for federal accountability. In school year 2022, we have made huge steps uh, for states. Uh, now all at a minimum are at substantially meets. I believe Nevada was the last state to move to substantially meets with the ACT. Now, Wisconsin, as you see on the bottom, they are using the ACT for ELA math and science, and just this past school year moved to fully meet in using the off-the-shelf ACT for federal accountability. I don't want to leave out how ACT workies is being considered and used as a fifth indicator for school quality or student success, or as it's loosely called, SQSS. Uh, here are the states that are using that in their fifth indicator. But notice the slide before, there are no states that are considering using ACT and ACT work keys for federal accountability. <coughs> now, of course, we would all like to think the peer review process is a linear process, but of course, a lot of this comes to uh, where that decision later letter comes along or the resubmission process and know that those states we've been in lockstep in providing those critical element evidence to help support the conversation of those states with their standards and reviewing a off the shelf nationally recognized assessments. Of course, we're not uh, sitting here or standing here as a vendor but as a partner, we're not asking the Kansas Department of Ed and the State Board to change their standards based on a product. We are looking to work with the KSDE team to consider the ACT and ACT workies based on your current standards. At no charge, we have provided an internal alignment document to KSDE to your Kansas state standards, and to KSDE and ACT, we've considered that strong alignment. The reason why I've highlighted the section I've highlighted is because it all starts with the board, starts with the commissioner's team, and it starts with uh, Kansas educators in terms of reviewing the content and considering that assessment. In this case, the nationally recognized ACT and ACT work keys. What you see in gray are the typical areas ACT has stepped in and assisted states in providing critical element components to pass 
peer review. Of course, we have the given of how does a state test, in this case the ACT, become a federally recognized assessment in the state. And I'm gonna say it's not gonna be easy. It's gonna be a battle. There's a reason why no states in the union are using the ACT or a college entrance exam and a career achievement indicator, in this case, the ACT work keys until now. As we, I'm sorry, I'm trying to advance the slide on my iPad and I have a PC uh, on the bottom here. We do have an opening to what USED has listed publicly on the uh, ESSA peer review website in that they are welcoming the uh, further definition of career and technical education standards. So we do have an opportunity to move forward with further clarification of how to use the ACT and ACT work keys for federal accountability. As we, as we move forward on paper, here are uh, the items that we can support a state in this direction. However, I can say that it's not just a test, it's not just a test company supporting a state, it's me. I've been with a district superintendent challenging the status quo of his district uh, level assessments 10 years ago. And now I stand here as support to that same individual sitting as commissioner of education. And so with that, I'm happy to take comments and questions for my presentation. Are there questions? Michelle. Thank you, Chairman Porter. We had a very good, robust discussion on the, during the break. Um, and, and what I talked about, I think I talked about this a couple years ago, um, when, we, when we do the testing and the, all the kids are out of the school building, the ones that take the test get to go for a couple hours, take the test. It's not done, uh, you're talking about how, uh, a lot of academics in, across Kansas, um, highly, um, you know, highly scholarly kids, but they don't have the skills. Well, they're not preparing for that ACT. They're not taking it seriously. They're not paying for it. They're not getting up on a Saturday morning at 7.30 in the morning to take a test um, that's rather than, oh, it's on a school day. I just get to take it during the school day. They're not taking it seriously the first time. Maybe. Some may be because they're like, I can't afford that test. This is, I'm going to take this seriously. Those kids may be, but again, they're not preparing for it. My son prepared for that. And he, you know, you have to pay for that on your own or you have to pay, the family's paying for that. Those are the kind of things that, I just, I, I just want to make sure I make that uh, public, that publicly stated because we're, we have a contract with you through the state, uh, through the state board that we approved a couple years ago. Um, recently in our legislation, they actually diminished the parent authority on, on taking those tests and, uh, and having the ability to opt out. Now you have to opt out of it. You're automatically opted in. And the Student Online Protection Privacy Act was, was, um, was gutted by our own legislature just recently in May. So. I, I get concerned about data, things getting collected, assessments being done on kids, the parents wanting to know what those, what those assessments are, what, um, what's involved in all that. I, I do know that it's a college ent entrance exam, that's how it used to be, and I, now I'm concerned about the ACT work keys when you do like, do we have to have, he keeps talking about two pieces of paper, are we going to have, based on our data points, are we gonna have the two pieces of papers only given to the kids that comply with all these, all these, um, um, Test and, tests and assessments, because I, I saw one of your screens that looked like it was down in, was it third grade? Third to eighth grade? What, let me see, what, what, maybe I missed something. Keep going, right there. Grade, uh, act expire, uh, act expire. ACT expire. Yes, okay, ACT. So I'm, I'm saying, I'm thinking, I don't know, fifth and seventh grade. I, I, again, a, assessment for a college entrance exam, that's something that you take later on. You take, an, that's pretty young. So what, what do those assessments look like for those kids that are that young in, in grade school? What are we, do we know? I mean, does anyone know what those are? And do the parents know what those assessments are about? Because it's not acquiring knowledge and taking tests and quizzes. That's, that's an assessment on a kid that's putting a value on a kid that young. And then those data points carry them all the way through uh, with their diploma after they graduate. And, if, the, and if, if ACT was funded by the legislature, that means the legislature owns that data, correct? 
the legislature, so they have to get those reports back to them? Mr. Chair. Let me answer the first on Arkansas, Michelle. They use the Aspire is a lower, it's not the ACT test as you're thinking of it. It is their state test that ACT designed to, to have at those lower grades. So that's an option that states had to choose from instead of designing their own. And they, Arkansas chose that. So it's not the, the ACT as, as you would know it uh, from the high school level. Thank you, Commissioner. He's, he's correct. This is basically the KU assessments in Arkansas. Like every state, they're responsible for testing three through eight and 10 or a high school grade level. We are just speak, specifically speaking to the ACT as a college entrance exam. ACT Aspire uh, will be sunsetted, unfortunately. There will be two years left in the Arkansas uh, contract, and that will go to an RFP. Uh, but it's essentially that. It's their ESSA requirements, uh, third through eighth and 10th grade. Mm -hmm. So um, breaking up your uh, questions and co comments, I want to uh, address that educators are uh, very essential in creating the, the um, or, or warranting the importance of what goes on in a classroom. As you mentioned, if the educator is unaware of the reason why this assessment is being delivered, it will transfer to the student, not knowing what this assessment is for. And I've sat in classrooms where when that educator, counselor, or um, support staff that are hired by the education system values whatever they're putting in front of that student, there is a high, high respect for that item assessment or uh, curriculum that's being taught. And so by valuing those assessments, in this case, we're looking at a nationally recognized college entrance exam, which gives them a reportable, nationally reportable score or a credential for them to decide on what uh, career path they will go into. That gives them not only the credential, but the self-realization of where they are at in terms of their national peers throughout the nation, as well as the 22,000 jobs we've profiled, the 350 careers that have, uh, part, excuse me, employers that have partnered with us uh, to say, yes, you are on track, or no, you need to consider taking four years of English if you are thinking about, or at least you self-reported on the uh, individual career and academic planning system that you've indicated engineer. Coleco, you better consider taking that four years of math because of that learning gap that currently exists uh, with your assessment scores. So it doesn't just take uh, a, an individual educator. I think the involvement of administration, buy-in, uh, counseling, as well as guardian and uh, parent support groups. There needs to be effective communication in that. Um, in, in a former role as a consultant, I spoke more at family parent teacher night conferences than I did at McPherson's uh, professional development because it takes a village to understand the data and value that data as it comes up to a student. It's not just a data set. These are human beings. So as far as the <clears throat> test being taken during school time, um, those ACT tests, if they were taken like on a Saturday, the child had to get up in the morning, take it at 7.30 in the morning, um, prepare for that. that that's, that's where I'm getting to is we're talking about, oh, they don't have the skills to self-regulate or self because we're not preparing them for that because we're not following through with taking a test once, preparing for that test. This is the day it is. You, you do bad on that test. You're learning from that, though. You, learn, you didn't do well. You're going go to you're gonna have to go back and restudy those or get better habits or whatever. You're, you're learning all that. I could go on and on, but yeah, it, so I, I just want to, can I, I just address a couple issues that you said. One, um, it's an opportunity for all students to take the test. The requirement is that the district needs to provide that opportunity. There is no opt-in uh, for the for the student uh, opt out, right? I mean, the student has a choice there to take to the assessment. It used to be until this year. 
the student has a choice to take the ACT. The district, the requirement with the funding is that the district must provide the opportunity. Okay. Part of that uh, we looked so at. So nobody has to take the test. Nobody has to take the test. We have a lot of districts. Um, I mean, we, we work very hard to make sure the district is providing the opportunity. That's an equity issue. We feel um, not everyone lives close enough to a Saturday testing location. There are, um, I mean, I don't know, you can listen to people with their stories about Saturday testing. I mean, it's an opportunity to take it during the school day. We also know that there are many districts in the state through uh, Clico's uh, great uh, salesmanship, right? I'm going to attribute it to that. That the district itself had made a decision that they would pay for students to take the ACT and do it during a school day, right? So to be to be fair across the state, because we value the, the um, the rigor of the assessment, then, then we make it available. Uh, second, the data, the data security. The legislature doesn't own the data. KSDE receives the data after the students test. Uh, once a year, we get two files. One file we get from the students we've paid for. That's the 11th graders. The other file that we get that we've got for many, many years going back I don't know, I mean, a very, very long time, right? Would be all the, the students that self-disclose that they're graduating, and it's called the graduating class data that we use, that we put aggregate data on the website, okay? And if we have a data sharing agreement uh, for how that data is controlled and how it can be shared, our end sizes apply. Um, Districts also receive information on the students that test in their district, whether that's the state paid, the district paid, or even students that go and take it on Saturday. Um, if they d disclose what district they live in, then the district has that information that comes back to them. So the, the security of the data is there. We, we report out at aggregate. If the legislature asks for the data, it's de-identified. Um, Kathy Grossenbacher's team has a program that takes away the student ID and replaces it with a, a different type of identification. So it's never traceable back to an individual student's score if you're worried about data privacy from the assessment. I represent 76 school districts where there is a tremendous amount of poverty. Paying for the ACT is a barrier to many of the students I represent. Saturday morning is not a self-regulation issue. It's I don't get to go to work and my family has to make some choices. So it's not, every place in Kansas is not the same. Providing this to students at school for free is a significant benefit or breaks barriers, it gives them the opportunity that they would not have otherwise. So, uh, so that's a, the, you know, we're not all the same. And for the students that I represent, this is it, the difference between being able to, to have that opportunity and not have it. We have two more questions and then we will move on. Melanie. Thank you. You can actually skip me. My question was answered. Appreciate it. And. Thank you. I just wanted to play off what you said, Mr. Chairman. I mean, the notion that some of us who are really lucky enough to have parents who could haul us into the high school or wherever to take a test on a Saturday and actually pay for it, just count ourselves as lucky. Because I represent a district that has 70 to 80 percent kids in poverty. They weren't taking it. But Topeka 501 was one of those districts, I think, that agreed to just pay for it for everybody and let these kids have the opportunity to take the test during school. Now, I think it's true all over that whether it was taken on Saturday or, or not, um, you know, we didn't explain to kids enough about the importance of it. But Randy, isn't there, an, I know um, that we get a lot of pushback from folks who don't even understand what we do with assessments that we need um, a more I guess nationally recognized assessment for our high school kids. The state assessments are all different across the country. You can't, you know, align one state to another. So is there an opportunity, like we're talking about here, maybe to team 
the ACT and the work keys maybe at 11th grade to replace the 10th grade math and English test so we would have a nationally normed measure of how well our kids are doing? Because <coughs> I'm not afraid of that. Because I, I think we do well. That could be a decision by this board if that was so decided. And they would go through, as Clico mentioned, the peer review process with the federal government to see if it met as these states did. But that would be a decision by this board. But is, I mean, just to explore it? Oh, to explore it. I mean, I think there, he's kind of laying out yeah. for you what, what that looks like. But this board um, had that before them and discussion. And I think the school superintendent said it advised you not to do that three years ago, four years ago? Well, we were just going to replace the state assessment with the ACT, which I get why you wouldn't really want to do that, because one's a performance score and the other's a potential score, if you will. But I think if you pair that with the work keys, you've got something kids can really take to the bank and parents can take to the bank that gives you a full measure of the kids' potential and their readiness for whatever comes after high school. But I think it's something we ought to explore. What would that look like? And is it going to meet kids' needs to help them be successful after high school and give us what we need to um, provide accountability? This, this board decides what assessment is used for federal accountability. So they could decide to pursue ACT and work keys at combination in lieu of the current assessment through the University of Kansas, if, if you so desire, the board so desire. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Anything else, Beth? Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we have recommendations from the Professional Standards Board, Teacher Vacancy and Supply Committee Working Group. It must be shade. Good morning, uh, Chairman Porter, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to go over these recommendations. So over the last few months, I've um, attempted to kind of keep you abreast of uh, the work that the group had, had been completing as far as uh, finding initiatives to get after the substitute vacancy shortage issue. Uh, but before I get into the recommendations, I'd first like to take a moment to thank uh, each group member again. Uh, it's been a busy time for them and for licensure and a lot of the dedicated professionals that you see here on this list not only served on this particular working group, we have other working groups outside of the Professional Standards Board, Teacher Vacancy Supply Group. Um, they, they've volunteered their time, been dedicated, uh, so it's, it was a pleasure to work with them all and I'm very thankful for that opportunity. So uh, before we get into the initiatives, uh, that we're going to make the recommendation for. I want to cover a few things. So you may have saw on the board item that there was only actually one item that we'll be voting on today. And that is the extended uh, extension of the expanded emergency substitute license. Uh, the reason why the other initiatives that are on, uh, that are being recommended require additional uh, regulation work and changes. And the proper way to do that is to push it through the regs committee, through the professional standards board and back to you all once that's completed. So in essence, was making sure we were not putting the cart before the horse and doing our due diligence and work. And some of the work that is uh, set up for, for instance, the substitute handbook and guidelines, there, it's, there's a lot of detail that will go into creation of uh, that particular item as well as creation of the regulations. So I just wanted to avoid confusion uh, on the votes. And then also timing was an issue as well. So as you all know, uh, regulations. I feel like I maybe I should have bought a lottery ticket back in a, the beginning of October because a regulation that had been pending for about five years finally got approved uh, 90 days into to, to, to my term here as the uh, director of teacher licensure. So I wanted to be very clear anything that uh, we recommend or any changes that are listed here would not be part of that regulation uh, update. Uh, this will be future work after that's uh, voted on and, and moved that we would come back to the board later. So um, any questions on that? OK. Yeah, yes, sir. I just want to clarify for everyone. So because we talked a lot about regulations around teacher licensure, if you approve what's being presented to you today, they then have to be drafted into new regulations 
they then have to go through a hearing process and those regulations then also have to be adopted by you. And then, and then if, and then that would start, unless something changes over the current, a multi-year cycle before it ever even comes back. Yes. So I just want, does everyone understand that? Because I think sometimes that can be confusing to people. Michelle. Oh, so can uh, thank you, Randy. Is, is this the, what we were talking about, the 99-page document? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, if, so do we, we still don't have that. I think Scott was going to send that to us last night. Yeah, that's going out tomorrow, uh, today to today. you, Friday So if now. we get that, is there a way to get a timeline? Like the, what, what changes, like because he said there are very few changes or very minor changes. Then if there are very few changes or very minor changes, then why are we even, why are we even doing this? So, so when they leave, once there's a hearing and they leave you, that process, it then has to go through Department of Administration and the Attorney General's office, and Mark may want to comment on this, to make sure that the language is in congruence with statute. And so that's why when I think Scott's mentioned to you, Michelle, that sometimes lawyers will argue about a the or an and or a, one word. It's because they're trying to be in congruence with statute and the regulation doesn't always change the intent, but it's what it's what happens. That process has taken multiple years now to get back to you. It if I leave has, anything out on that, that one? That's my concern is it is March of 2018, and now we're, um, I think, 18 months. We heard something, other, you know, in one of the other meetings that was 18 months between the AG's office and administration and the board, uh, Kansas Department of Education. And... He told me all the people that it was sent to. I would think the board, since we have to vote on this today, and then to go would would have had it, would have had that ninety nine page document, even if it's minor or there are very few changes. All these other people got it, but we didn't. Well, get you it. did. The board did vote on that, and then it went through that process. Mark, do you want to explain I mean, that? Like maybe thing? incremental. Play. This is the whole thing, and seeing the whole thing in one big document of ninety nine pages, and seeing the seeing the history and the and the, and the timeline of everything. Does that make sense? We might have gotten bits and pieces at different meetings, but if if he said I didn't vote on it because it happened back in 2018, I don't know what I didn't vote on, I guess. The board, the board did vote. And so the board as a governing body did vote on it at that one time. It is, I think he, uh, Scott clarified for you that you weren't on the board at that time, but right. it has been before the board. I think we discussed yesterday that it was, uh, it was on the website. Um, it's on, available, and... Uh, we also discussed that's going to be circulated. So um, typically when it's so long like that, it includes both the existing language and shows the changes. So when you refer to it as 99 pages, it's not 99 pages of changes. It's it's trying to show, like looking at a red line version, uh, you know, where you see the, the changes, the deletions. And Scott, when, when, was there anything you wanted to add? I mean... And I, I will just add that sometimes a, a shall or a might or a direct or whatever makes a huge difference. If you were following the legislation and parents' rights and that you looked at that bill, the top portion of the bill took away our rights. The bottom portion might have, um, that's where the surveys and all those things kind of went down there that the schools are not now going to have these eight things that they're going to have to do for parents. But if you read the top paragraph, I want to get this out there. They, go back and read the top paragraph just some incremental changes of shall, direct, you have a uh, right to inspect. No, parents have the ultimate right to direct their child's education. It's a simple paragraph. It's KS 38141. It, it, it's, I don't want them to change parents' rights. So that's why this thing is very important that we read it and understand it before we vote on it. And um, because legislation voted on stuff that they didn't read maybe or thoroughly understand at the time they were passing it. Or not passing it, and I, I think those are those are the kind of things I want the public to understand. Is don't scream about parent rights when we were actually diminishing our parent rights by that bill that was trying to be passed through legislation. Okay. So, I want I'm trying to give it what's going to happen with this situation right now, which is this is not in current regulation. This is, and if you pass it, there would have to be regulations drafted that would start that process. All over. So I just wanted everyone to be aware of it. it. Has nothing to do with this right now. 
So I don't know, Scott, you may want to answer this and then Shane needs to probably get back to. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And Apologize. what Commissioner Watson just said was uh, exactly what I was going to say. If I could, Wednesday, uh, next month, ignore this. This has nothing to do with what you're going to vote on, a win on next month because it's not there. Um, the only thing that, if I understand correctly, what Shane is asking you to vote on is just to approve the concept of an expanded emergency substitute license. Approve the concept of emergency sub license lasting two years. That is not correct. Okay, well I knew that was gonna happen. Um, whatever he's asking you to vote on, in fact, I would tell you he was originally going to bring suggested regulatory language and I said, please don't do that, you're going to confuse things. Will it take multiple years to get the next regs change? I really don't think so. One, you're not changing darn near everything in the regs. And the second part is, we're gonna start from a much better starting place than we did last time. I'll just leave it at that. And we're gonna do it right, and it's not gonna take multiple years to get it done. Hopefully that answers some of your concerns. Sorry. Right. Today we're Thank only you. talking about emergency substitute license, period. Correct, and recommendations from the Vacancy Supply Committee and uh, the PSB Working Group. So no regulation changes whatsoever. All right, so as far as the, the one motion that um, we're gonna bring up today, this is the expanded, the modified, the modified emergency substitute license that the board rec uh, approved back in June. Uh, the working group did uh, recommend that we extend that through June 30th of 2023. Uh, we also had discussion about this as a permanent option uh, at one point, and the working group decided that that's not the best uh, route forward for uh, students in Kansas or the profession. So this will not be a permanent re recommendation. This is temporary. This will expire, pending your vote, it would expire in June uh, 30th of 2023. And then at that point, that license would be done uh, and there wouldn't be no plans to uh, follow up and reissue a license of this nature. So just to be clear, once again, which are the, the motion is just the extension. The area that I have highlighted in yellow is the language that has changed since you voted on this particular um, license back in June. Melanie. Thank you, Chairman Porter. Would you mind going back to the first slide that yes. has the list of names on it? Nope, keep going. Oh, the names? That one. So has this working group approved this proposal? Yes. All of these people have voted specifically and said yes, if, or was this a majority vote situation? If, majority vote. So not everyone was able to make every meeting. So individuals that were able to make each meeting, it was a majority vote. Okay. Can you tell me what the percentage of the vote was? Um, for the extension, uh, we had uh, two individuals. It was two of uh, seven, I think, that... Uh, were not in favor of the extension. Uh, the rest of the voting members were in favor of it. The rest of the members that were in attendance? That were in that attendance, day. yes. Do you know how many that was? Yeah, I think it was seven. S seven total, yeah. okay. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Janet, yeah. Would you please repeat, I, I want to make sure I understand it. Did you say this was to extend through uh, the end of this year or through, June? Through the end of this school year. It's so right year. now this license is set to expire on December 31st of 2022. Uh, so this um, recommended motion would extend it through June 30th of 2023. And then are you, going, are you going to come up with something else and not bring this back? Or will this be possibly something that will be looked at in the future as a permanent thing? Well. Uh, this working group made this recommendation, so it wouldn't be something that, I that we would look at in the future. It, it would not. Would not. Would not. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it, that being the case, we'd go back to 60 hours? Yes. For everybody. It would, well, the 60 hours, the two options that are out there, bachelor's degree or 60 college credit hours from a regionally accredited college or university. Okay. Melanie? Me again, thank yes, you, Chairman Porter. So I, I have to ask, is there a conversation happening 
around, we've gotten a lot of feedback um, for months now about the 18 years old and older, the high school graduate piece of this. Mm -hmm. um, are you discussing potentially an option where a student has graduated from high school, they are now interested in being a teacher? I've, I've heard anecdotally of just a few instances where those are great candidates to have in that classroom. It's excellent experience for them and they are enrolled in a program that is training them for a future as a teacher. Yes. Is there gonna be a component that you're considering for that? Yes, so we're working in a, a, a different group setting. Uh, you may have heard the term of uh, a, a federally registered apprenticeship program. So as discussions are moving forward on that, there's a possibility that that particular population could be uh, brought in uh, in that particular program. So um, I, it, it is an option, but, but we're still working that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify, this isn't the only action today. This just extends the license, and we have another proposal for the permanent fix going forward, right? The change in the regulations. <clears throat> right. So, right. Okay. well, it, it's more of a, a discussion item for you because oh, okay. I'm not prepared. Just... We have a lot of work to do to actually have a recommendation and get all the language and everything else completed to send to you. So these, these were the rec recommendations of the group for your awareness. And then we'll move back to the Professional Standards Board through the Recs Committee and develop those actual recommendations to come back. And when we uh, update the, the language, then you would have the opportunity to vote on it again. Okay, because I thought we had that in our packet today was the changes that had the, um, the making the substitute handbook, making them two years. Yes, so those those are discussion items that just that discussion, be, not action today. Correct, because of the regulation work that has to be done on the backside for those particular items. And what I mentioned, putting the cart before the horse, uh -huh. because of how this group was set up. Right. A lot of this still needs to be ran through the re regulations committee uh, before oh, okay. it comes back through. So we were on a short suspense, and I wanted you all to know that these were the recommendations of the group, and this is going to dictate our future work to get after the vacancies for substitutes. Janet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just remembered that uh, I had been told that uh, one of the challenges for teachers who serve on this group is that the uh, meetings are held during the school day. <coughs> Excuse me, which <coughs> many of them simply can't leave because they don't have enough subs, period. It's just, uh, uh, no, it's just, it's today, let's face it. So is there any discussion on possibly having the meetings that would accommodate, because I think the teacher's input would be extremely important yeah. on this committee. No, I, and I am willing, that our team is willing, any time that's convenient to meet uh, with them, if it's after hours, whatever days, we will make that happen. So we try to send out um, options, uh, like herding cats, trying to get everybody scheduled to line up when you meet, but uh, the licensure team is more than willing to make uh, whatever accommodations for time and to, to hold these meetings, so. I have a tremendous internal conflict. I'm arguing with myself, yep. uh, which usually is not productive. I've been asked by numerous people uh, in, in meetings uh, with teachers uh, uh, early on, you know, said, does this expire? And I've said, yes, it expires in the last of December. So that part of my conflict is that if I vote in favor of this, I feel like my credibility with the people that I've told that is, uh, is in que that, that, that they would, could legitimately uh, question my credibility. The other side of that is whenever I meet with uh, people that hire substitutes, tell me that they don't have any, and this has been a tremendous benefit to them. So that's my internal conflict. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know how to, I also, on a different basis, see, I don't see 60 hours of underwater basket weaving as a, as a particularly beneficial, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, 60 hours in anything. Uh, whenever I know that there are people that uh, I have witnessed that uh, have worked with student groups that don't have college degree, that, were, that work with student groups, 
uh, you know, with with 4-H or with uh, Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or teaching Sunday school for 30 years, that would be a much more effective one-day second grade substitute teacher than I would be, and I have all sorts of degrees and, and qualifications. So I would be qualified but incompetent to do that. So I was really hoping that we would look at other options, uh, completely vetted, you know, uh, by that. And so, so, so I'm, I'm concerned that that we're, I, I, I'm concerned about that. You know, I, I, to me, the sixty hours is not a magic number, but there has to be vetted ways to to make sure that people are qualified to do that. Which is unrelated to this motion. I shouldn't have brought that up, Ann. No, I guess I'm. I have the same concerns, but then we were we were asked by teachers' organizations to, to send this to the teacher vacancy and the professional standards board and ask them to come up with a recommendation, and here it is. Now, my only concern is we've got these other recommendations in front of us, and I hope we can move on those sooner than later because they did put it together a permanent recommendation for what to do with an emergency sub, and I'd really like to get get going on that but I share your concern but I think we did what they asked us to do and here's the recommendation well, what is the schedule for the next recommendations well th that's for us to us so th there's not at the moment there's not a schedule because it's going the work's going to dictate when we're, we're able to complete it as it goes through the basically through the regulation committee and uh, some of the stuff's developed so it it could be months could be years and then there's always the option as well if we can continue to do additional work get the group back together and and you know rework some of these recommendations if that's what the board so desires you know the crisis is now you know and we all know that I'm not telling you anything you don't already know and and whenever I'm meeting with superintendents groups which I do with some degree of frequency this is always an issue so we we, we have to have help you know and as I say, I'll tell you, the internal conflict with me. So, I'm... anything else? If not, a motion would be in order. Ben, I move that the Kansas State Board of Education modify the qualifications of the emergency substitute license to include high school diploma, completion of an online substitute training component, verification of hire in a state accredited local education agency, and be limited to no more than 15 consecutive days. In the same assignment, this provision will expire June 30th, 2023. Is there a second to that motion? Betty seconds that motion. Any further discussion? Jim. We've seen this before, and when we, are we going to see it again? That's not the plan, no. Okay. Once this expires, this is done. I'll remind you of that in June. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Anything else? <laughs> All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All opposed? Two, abstain. One. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, so the other changes that we, that we made. So the group looking at the teaching, uh, the substitute teaching profession, if you think about what, how they're tasked, you, the actual profession, you're called, you're on short notice, you may not know what district you're getting called to. You don't know if you're working Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. Um, and it's just uh, very uh, temporary. Well, I guess not temporary, it's a good word, but you're, you just don't have a set schedule. And that profession itself, and, and you're not paid very much, we wanted to try to find ways that we could uh, build the profession, support those substitute teachers, and see if that was a way to uh, uh, retain them uh, and keep them in, uh, in those schools that they serve. So with the substitute hand handbook and guidelines, this was designed to make sure that there was some type of mechanism that those individuals have support, uh, they feel like they belong uh, in the district, and uh, they're welcomed, and uh, you know, actually get feedback on uh, what they're doing, have the opportunity for professional development for other, just like other educators, uh, so they can continue to, to, to impact students' lives. So as I stated, <coughs> regulations, this particular implementation of this uh, handbook and guidelines, it will require something similar to our regulations for uh, mentoring 
and professional development. So if you're in the mentoring regulations, 91-1-215 through 91-1-219. So there's a lot of steps, a lot of layers to it. I'm not saying it's exactly like that, but it's that type of work. And then there would also be a compliance piece uh, that would be tied to this, that it would have to be worked through, as well as actually designing what that handbook uh, and guidelines are. So that's another reason that we have to have fidelity on that work through the regulations committee before it comes back to you. So the emergency substitute license duration, uh, once again, this is a uh, regulation change. Um, so currently at any given time, we have approximately uh, 11,000 uh, emergency substitute licenses that are active. Each year we have individuals that apply after semester, uh, and if, if, they, if they're not aware and read their license, their license expires in uh, June, so they need to renew it. Uh, this kind of adds confusion to the district of when they can use them and also uh, adds additional cost to that individual. Uh, and it's kind of a factor that keeps them from wanting to apply again. So right now, for instance, we have approximately 600 uh, substitute emergency substitute applications that are at an FP needed process of that of those applications about a third approximately 200 are individuals that applied last year and uh, their license expired and now we're requesting them because we had to remove them out of the wrap back system um, asking them to resubmit fingerprints and a fingerprint card um, and payment to qualify for that license so in order to help districts and uh, also, the individuals extending that to two years uh, was a was a sensible move that the that the group felt that we could make. The legacy license uh, this also will require numerous regulation updates. So we're talking about 91-2 uh, 91-1-200. Uh, that's definition of terms. 91-1201 uh, types of licenses. 91-1203 requirements and 91 dash 1-205 uh, renewal but uh, once again that's why we're not voting on it today but the group did recommend that this is an opportunity to increase uh, substitute pool and also teacher vacancies so at any given year we end up with approximately a thousand individuals that retire <clears throat> and then of those thousand <clears throat> not that specific thousand but uh, we have about a hundred individuals that are reported as retired drawing capers and go back into the school system so for those individuals out of that, that, that thousand group that retire, we're not really having that many that are actually going back into the school system. This will be another option that gives uh, those veteran educators, one, it values their service, two, it uh, allows them to avoid uh, some of the requir requirements for relicensure and they can immediately serve in the profession uh, as a substitute or a standard teacher. I still have a license, so when mine expires, I can get a 20 year license? Well, uh, what, provided I live eventually if it gets approved yes <laughs> yes sir I can understand why you wouldn't approve it but go ahead yeah. <laughs> Betty uh, quick question yes ma'am is there an impact on capers they're retired <coughs> yes so there are certain rules for individuals um, depending on what type of position they're in uh, the substitute they're considered a contractor uh, it's not the same as a licensed teacher I don't know the exact percentages uh, but there are time limits for individuals that have to wait before serving if they're going to serve full time in a position. And based on age, there is an impact to um, a cost that's fixed depending on age when an individual retires. So it sounds like it could or could not be a penalty imposed on them. Well, it's going to depend. It, it would depend on if they're full time contracted. So they retire and then the district wants them to come back and be a, a full-time teacher again. So that's a different situation than if an individual is a uh, substitute teacher that's substituting intermittently. Um, they're considered a contractor, so I think the rules are different for that. Okay. Thank but you. I am not the subject matter expert on um, capers, though. I, I just wondered as an, as an overview because I could see that as perhaps an obstacle for uh, retired education educators to come back. Um, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Melanie. Thank you, Chairman Porter. Obviously, there's a problem to be solved here with regards to supply. Um, we've talked before, and it's, it's not in this deck, but are you looking at something new when it comes to requirements for reciprocal or creating a reciprocal license? I've talked to a lot of educators 
who are now working in Kansas, but who came from other states and described the hurdles of that process. Is that on the table? Yeah, so a, a couple things to be aware of. Um, the regulation that you will review um, and, and vote on next month, there is a change in there for our out-of-state um, individuals that are coming from out-of-state. Previously, we required them to hold a valid out-of-state license uh, whenever they transfer. Uh, the reg, however, is gonna change to has held. So it means if they completed their program, achieved their license, and they have that, ex that license that may be expired, but they, they achieved it, then we can bring them in and process their license as long as they meet the, the rest of the requirements. So in the past, how that impacts the educator negatively, um, another state, let's say Illinois, decides that if your license expires, you've got to do X, Y, and Z and pay this amount of money to do it. So it reduces that burden on that individual who's completed the program and achieved that license. Uh, other initiatives that are working, um, well, but for this conversation, that's, that's probably the, the best one I can bring up. Okay, pending your questions. Any more questions? Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, we will reconvene at 1.30, I think.
boarding the meeting back together, and we have now a recognition of PTA Schools of Excellence. Welcome to the State Board of Education. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to recognize four outstanding Kansas PTAs and their schools. I'm Patty Urich, the Kansas PTA president, and with me today is Sarah Dunn, our Kansas PTA um, family engagement chairman. We thank the board for allowing us to be here and celebrate these outstanding um, units and the celebrate the outstanding collaboration and work of these four PTAs and their schools. I'll start with a brief overview of the National PTA School of Excellence program and then proceed into presenting each honoree with a framed certificate from Kansas PTA. I'm gonna read kind of fast, so I hope I'm not too garbled, but I wanna stay within our timeline. I don't wanna make you guys off, off schedule. Um, and then afterwards, if we have time, if you have any questions, you can ask a question if you'd like. The goal of the National PTA School of Excellence program is for PTAs to partner with their schools to engage families in student success and continuous school improvement, thus enriching the educational experience and overall well-being of all students. Through this free program, the PTA and the school work collaboratively to assess how the families fill their school measures up to a number of research-based key indicators for effective family engagement. These indicators are framed around the National PTA Standards for Family School Partnerships, which, is this, which this board endorsed in 2008. The principal and the PTA are also surveyed using a similar assessment tool. The PTA and the school then identified a shared school improvement goal and objective based on the national standards for family school partnerships. The focus was to be on one of three areas, improving family education, family engagement in education, ensuring students' health and safety, or supporting arts in education. Then they submitted their goal and their initial assessment results to National PTA, and National PTA then sent them a customized roadmap that gave them specific suggestions and resources. They also re received access to a dedicated area of the National PTA website populated with a wealth of resources and tools. The PTA and the school then worked on the shared school improvement goal and reevaluated the families, the principal, and the PTA at the end of the school year. The pre and post assessments are called the Family School Partnership Scans. The final scan results with a narrative were submitted to National PTA by June 1st and evaluated during the summer. The evaluation was based on their own progress given their beginning resources. Each PTA school was evaluated on its, evaluated on its own merits. The first week in August, our four outstanding PTAs and schools were notified that they were a National PTA School of Excellence Award recipient. The designation is for two years, for 2021 to 2023. Our hope is that all PTAs and PTA schools in Kansas will participate in this outstanding program to make sure their families feel welcomed and empowered and support student success, and that PTA is a key partner for continuous school improvement. And now to honor our 2021-2023 School of Excellence Award recipients. They worked extremely hard last year by breaking down barriers to engage families in ways that made a substantial and positive impact on their school and on student success. When I call your PTA and school name, will you please come forward to the podium so we can introduce you? Sarah and I will then present you with your certificate. After we've presented the certificates, You'll take your seat, and then at the end of it, we'll take um, group photos. <coughs> Would the representatives from Broken Arrow Elementary PTA and Broken Arrow Elementary <coughs> School please come forward? It's my honor to introduce Broken Arrow Elementary School principal, or PTA president, I'm sorry, Dr. Liz Kozad, in Delicate, and Broken Arrow Elementary School Principal Ryan Horn. Dr. Hubbard, where are you at? <laughs> <laughs> and Shawnee Mission School District Superintendent Dr. Michelle Hubbard. <laughs> Upon returning to full-time in-person learning without restrictions, they took the opportunity to re 
the opportunity to revamp their music and art curriculum to integrate holistic cross-cultural learning, emphasizing history of people, groups, and our countries while learning music, dance, and different art media styles. As much as possible, this cross-cultural learning was aligned with general education learning and across specials to create a, co a cohesive educational experience. Their new global music curriculum taught the students about vocal music and instruments, as well as regional dances and games. Kindergarten and first grade focused on Asia, learning the fan dance with fans that were made in art class and folk songs. Second grade learned La Raspa and Mexican folk dance songs. Third and fourth grade learned indigenous songs and dances from the Choctaw, Nanticoke, and Comanche Nation. Fifth and sixth grade learned about ragtime and created a cup routine to go with Scott Joplin's The Entertainer, learning about American music as well as BIPOC composers. Each class was filmed performing for a compilation video that was played at their school's cultural arts festival. Their new global arts curriculum taught the students about different art styles, Kindergarten learned to make hand fans for use with the fan dance. In first grade, the students made Japanese cherry blossom prints. Each grade made dragons in various media, depending on the grade level, and while, it, while learning about Asia. Primary grades made dancing skeleton collages, and upper grades make su made sugar skull masks with paper mache while learning about Latin America. Primary grades made kinte cloth prints, while upper grades made African tribal mask point prints. Grades two through six made totem poles with collage and made mixed media ind indigenous winter counts, pictographic calendars. These were all displayed at the Cultural Arts Festival. They had a Cultural Arts Festival for their Spring Title I Family Engagement Evening and their first unmasked indoor in-person event in two years. In addition to the music video and art display, they had a station for learning the various dances games taught during the year, Mencala Game Area, face painting, Day of the Dead tattoos, and henna art station. They provided dinner with samplers of a variety of ethnic foods. They also hosted a book fair. They have never had a more successful engagement night in terms of number of people in the building and cultural sharing amongst their highly socioeconomically and racially diverse community. Families were able to fully immerse in a global art, music, playtime, and culinary experience together. The overwhelming feedback, even for those with more than a dozen years at the school was that it was the best event they could recall. They are thrilled to have integrated global cultures into their art and music curriculum in such an impactful manner and are looking forward to building on the success of this, inner, of this event. Congratulations to Broken Arrow Elementary PTA and Broken Arrow Elementary School. Would the representatives from Mill Creek Elementary PTA and Mill Creek Elementary School please come forward? It's my honor to introduce Mill Creek Elementary School President, Heather Novoski, PTA School of Excellence Chairman, Amy Hirsch, and Mill Creek Elementary School Principal, Jonathan Farrell, and Shawnee Mission School District Superintendent, Michelle Hubbard. <laughs> this year, the Mill Creek Elementary PTA focused on building a solid emotional, solid, Social Emotional Learning, SEL program during the School of Excellence application year. The PTA board invited mental health professionals and school leaders relevant to the Mill Creek community to join them at their PTA meetings. They prioritized funding in this year's budget to send a staff member to the Cassell System SEL four-week training session where they learned the process for building a strong SEL program at Mill Creek. And they also organized an SEL team based on that Cassell training, which includes school staff, family members, students, and community leaders. Their most significant accomplishment was building back the community relationships that had fallen away during COVID. The PTA worked diligently to invite community members to speak at PTA meetings, bring in community programs to present for at-school field trips, 
Ask family members to participate in science enrichment activities and reading groups. And create partnership nights with local businesses. By the end of the year, their score rating Mill Creek as a central part of the community had significantly increased. The SL SEL team at Mill Creek will continue to guide the vision for the SEL program and create annual goals for the community while learning what SEL best practice in their school looks like. Congratulations to Mill Creek and Mill Creek Elementary School. Thank you. Good job. One more. One more. We got one more. With Shawnee Mission East High School and Shawnee Mission East High School PT, PTSA, please come forward. It is also my honor to introduce the Shawnee Mission East PTSA President, Michelle Schmidt. Shawnee Mission East PTSA School of Excellence Chairman Tiffany Dirks, and Shawnee Mission East High School Principal Jason Perez, and Shawnee Mission School District Shawnee Mission School Superintendent Dr. Michelle Hubbard. One of the key priorities last year was to increase the sense of belongingness or community at Shawnee Mission East. Coming out of COVID, people felt very isolated and disconnected. There was especially true for teenagers. Many of the kids lost much of their high school career. Many were experiencing high school for the first time, even though they were sophomores. They were still coming back to a hybrid schedule and mandating masking for much of the year. As you know, creating a sense of belongingness and community in this atmosphere was a lofty and important goal. What they did for their School of Excellence project was to survey parents, teachers, and students at the beginning and end of the school year to gauge their sense of belongingness and community. Mr. Perez implemented several programs with this goal in mind. He made seminar time more meaningful to students by having clubs recruit during that time to let students know how they could be involved in school in addition to academics. He allowed many clubs to meet during seminar time to enable kids to participate, even if they are not able to stay after school because of work or family commitments. Mr. Prez also instituted a home-based fifth hour teacher that would check in with students on a regular individual basis. The teacher would work with the students, school, and family to make sure the student was getting the support they needed. Sometimes this was just a quick email to the parent saying that the teacher had met with their child and enjoyed getting to know them better. This was very well received by the parents as well as students. We found those programs to be very successful in getting parents and students reintegrated and perhaps more integrated into the Shawnee Mission East community. Congratulations to Shawnee Mission East PTSA and Shawnee Mission East School. Would representatives from Timber Creek Elementary, PTA and Timber Creek Elementary School please come forward? And lastly, it's my honor to introduce Timber Creek Elementary School PTA President Heather Southwell Timber Creek Elementary School Principal, Dr. Pam Baki, Timber Creek Elementary School Assistant Principal, Tara Walrud, and Blue Valley School District Deputy Superintendent, Dr. Katie Collier. As the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic improved and restrictions loosened, Timber Creek felt the 21-22 school year was an excellent time for them to participate in the School of Excellence program to strengthen their team and move forward with new opportunities. By taking part in this program, Timber Creek Elementary School was able to identify a focus area and implement strategies to implement, to improve the social, emotional well-being of their students. The interventions that were implemented were a quarterly email to new families providing community resources, fifth grade farewell activities throughout the entire year to promote collaboration with other schools, communicating with all families regarding activities that take place during the school day and starting a monthly letter in a local news neighborhood magazine with updates and upcoming events. 
The staff and PTA work together to develop the strategies that best fit their school. The experience of participating in this national PTA program provided the school with tools and guidance to further promote partnership between the students, families, and community. Congratulations to Timber Creek Elementary PTA and Timber Creek Elementary School. And I bet you ran it all, didn't you? That's right. Um, did you guys have any questions you'd like to ask of any of the... We just wanted to make sure that we take this opportunity to congratulate all of you on a job well done. We really appreciate the, uh, the uh, r relationships that you've built with uh, parents in your community and, uh, and find that to be extremely important to the success of each student. Janet, you may speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just can't pass up this opportunity to uh, thank the PTA. I, uh, as many of you know, or maybe many of, you, many of you don't know, my first volunteer work began as a, in the PTA. When my young, oldest child entered kindergarten, I became uh, the uh, kindergarten room mother chairman. <laughs> and so it went on and I served in many positions up to it, including the state level. And, and what always fascinated me about PTA is people always thought PTA that I that didn't know about PTA, they thought all it was was something to have uh, room parties and also to uh, bake cookies and to build playgrounds, <laughs> just earn money to do that. Well, that's so wrong, and you've proven it here, and this is so amazing. And I know how boy, how challenging these awards are and how much effort was put into it because it is parental involvement we need and everything. So I'd like to congratulate you, Patty, for being the president, but all the, each of these schools. Thank you so much for all you do, and please keep it up. Thank you, Janet. And we like to take pictures with the uh, people that we honor, and so. Uh, we'll be doing that in just a second, okay. absolutely. But before we take our group photos, Kansas PTA would again like to say thank you to the PTAs, to the PTAs, the schools, the superintendents, and to you, the board, who have all supported this program and thank you for allowing us to honor these outstanding 2021-23 National PTA School of Excellence recipients. I would also like to extend a, a thank you to the very nice individual with the Kansas Board of Education who is taking photos for us today, and a special thank you to the Board Secretary Barbie Hughes for all her help in coordinating today's event. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, nice to have a face to go with the name and the voice. <laughs> and I'd also like to take a second for a personal comment to thank Janet for all of her years of service. I know next month is your last year, or last time sitting in that chair. And I believe you told me it was 24 years that you've sat in that chair. And on behalf of PTAs, children, families, thank you for your service as well as everyone else. But it will be very sad next year not to see you sitting here. Okay, photos. Um, would the Kansas Commissioner of Education, um, Dr. Randy Watson, come up, as well as the Board Chair Jim Porter, Board Vice Chair Janet Wall, Board Members M Melanie Haas, Melon, Mel Michelle Dombrowski, um, because you're from those regions, one, two, and three. <coughs> and Sarah, you're here, and myself. With Shawnee Mission, I'm going to start out with the high school first. With Shawnee Mission East High School, um, with the superintendent and Shawnee Mission East School come up, we're going to get your, your photo first. I, I request that after we get the board members in, that the, all, the whole board join us. I would love that. I would love that. We need a riser. <laughs>
Let's get Arrow, there. you're in this one next. And then.
this last, uh, we've, we've received the recommendations from the uh, task force chaired by Mr. McNeese, and then last month we looked at some alternatives to that, and at this point we're going to uh, have that presentation, and then we will decide uh, at the end of this presentation whether or not we're ready to vote. Uh, on graduation requirements. Uh, at that point, we'll make that decision. It's a, it's, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to thank uh, Jim, as you mentioned, uh, Melanie, Betty, um, and um, Jean, because uh, I reached out to them and said, I think I asked a couple questions. Do you think we can get some, do you want to get something done? And the answer was yes. I reminded them that Janet wanted them to get something done. And, uh, and then we said, where, can, where do you think the commonality is? So I'm gonna share that with you and then I'll open it up for, you know, just for your discussion. So the first, again, there's no change. You'll see what, what was altered a little bit. This recommendation would be for the agency to develop very specific guidelines, examples, a handbook, if you would, that would be ongoing and updated around what does mastery of competency look like so that a school district in St. Francis or a school district in Galena can look at that and go, oh, we might be able to do that or we could do that. Again, no school district would have to do it. They would have the option to do it with a really strong focus on a student's individual plan of study. No change from the task force recommendation. Also no changes on the post-secondary assets. Students would graduate a high school, so Shawnee Mission East, and have two or more of the assets from the following list. And because the list is, was broken up by the task force into kind of career choices or work-related cho choices, and academic choices, it looks like it's two lists. It really is one, and a student would be uh, have two or more from the combined list. So you heard today around workplace learning experiences. Seal of bioliteracy, you've, you've seen those uh, recommendations uh, and, and honoring. Junior ROTC, 90% of tents in high school. The, an Eagle Scout. These are things that business and industry say are important to the development of a child and should be recognized. Here's some academic, certain number of college credit, senior project, an international board, baccalaureate exam for those that have that. Again, no changes to this. And then courses. New, a little bit new. Or maybe it's old, it's new, but it will kind of maybe going back. So communications. The task force recommended a half a credit of, of communication. Could be done in a speech class, could be done in debate forensics, could be done in an English class spread out over time, but a half a credit in those four years should be dedicated to communication. If you want to know where the task force got that recommendation, which hasn't been changed since their recommendation, that communication, oral communication, is the number one hard skill asked for by uh, employers uh, that is, is, is lacking. So society and humanities, okay. So you know the task force said, take a half a unit of social studies and the history of government, take a half a unit of fine arts, add back one of humanities. Last month, I said, maybe you want to add to that. The group that got together, plus Superintendent's Advisory Committee and my Principal's Advisory Committee said, why are you doing that? Why don't we just go back to what we had on this one? Seems like it's working fine. Let's keep it at no change. And thus, that's, what, that's what's new being brought to you. I say it's what's new, Dina, because it actually it's what's there now but it is new in the terms of how we've come about it. An emphasis on STEM. So three units of math, three units of science remain at no change. The STEM elective would be a computer science elective, yes. 
Advanced math, advanced science, yes. Robotics, advanced CT, career and tech ed. So advanced welding, advanced ag mechanics, uh, anything of those. Advanced technology, there are kids doing that, or any agri advanced agriculture, any STEM elective. So this is, this is what the task force recommended. It's slightly different than what KBOR asked you, um, but there has been an ask uh, of the legislature and KBOR to add a computer science. This adds an elective that could be computer science uh, that would be left over uh, to, the, to the families to decide, but it does increase the emphasis on STEM. And then finally, the employability and life skills section, which currently is one unit PE and, one, and six units of electives, would go to a half a credit of PE, half of health. And then what is new is that the four board members talked about students said they wanted a life skills course. What if we put, instead of a half a credit of life skills, a half a credit of financial literacy, said one credit, but a lot of school district to separate that out if they wanted, teach it separately. They could teach it through mastery competency you know, uh, awarding, but let the local school district kind of define that for themselves. Uh, we'd obviously have to write some standards around that, uh, 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 life skill standards, and then there'd be lots of opportunities in curriculum around that. Five credits of IPS choices, so electives, and the other difference here is moving from 21 total credits, increasing that rigor to 22 total credits. No change on the FAFSA, recommend, or having it as a mandatory completion, kinda, you've heard me say that, Ben, because a student can opt out, a family can opt out, or a school district can opt a student out if they feel that that's in their best interest. As you know, the reason for this ask is that millions of dollars uh, allocated to Kansas in Pell Grant money gets unused each year. That's, K that's a Kansas Board of Regents ask. Also from um, suggestion from Betty and, and the four, set up a review committee that'd be made up of teachers, parents, administrators, that the minute this goes into effect would start to be looking at data analyzing what is the impact this is having on Kansas kids and families and what potential changes should be brought in the future so that maybe you're not waiting another 20 to 25 years before you're taking a look at it again. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd just open up for the board discussion. I'll stay here in case there's anything that you wanna take a look at. In like, the event that we approve this today, the first class that would be uh, impacted were the current eighth graders. Class of 27, if my math is correct. And then that gives us plenty of time to work on like life skills standards. And the handbook and the regulations, because you'll have to develop regulations for this. And who makes up the uh, review committee? Is it, you say that, or did I miss oh, that? Oh, that'll be parents, uh, teachers, administrators. We'll bring you back maybe a format of who would be on it. Okay. And then that would probably just, they would, they, once it got uh, in line, then they could bring you back recommendations as to what they see okay. in the implementation. So, so we've got time before, yes. before fully, full implementation. That's correct. We have time to do a lot of planning. Yeah. And let, me, let me just say, if you look at this, so communications, Everyone's doing 40 units of language arts now with principal option. Variety of stu a variety of, almost every school has some kind of speech class, communications class. Some require it for graduation. There's no change in the next one, so that's currently there. There'd be a STEM elective, so you'd have to get geared up for that. And then you, most school districts, as you know, are offering financial literacy. Many are requiring it. The life skills course would be an elective if it was offered currently. So those would be the impact. You also, again, remember, moving from 21 to 22 will primarily impact, won't impact any comprehensive high school because they're, they're at 23 or above. It will impact some alternative school students that, that use 21, 
some students um, that, that may be in uh, foster care, some students that, um, that may um, be in other institutions. So they have the uh, ability to go to what the, the state uh, guidelines are. School districts can always have more. And that's a, yeah, you see and that example and, all across Kansas And now. most do. Well, currently, 100% of them do. Of the, of the 286 school districts, high schools like we just saw, all of them go above yours currently. And if I remember correctly, uh, somebody on the task force indicated that whenever they were talking to students that life skills was something that was requested by students. The, Melanie can you, answer you, that you, through you, the you, survey, you, yes. I, I thought that, yeah. okay. Uh, Ann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Randy, uh, do we have, uh, going back to communications, is that, you think, well enough defined in standards, like within ELA standards, that people would know what that is? Yes, because we have oral communication in there. I think we might want to highlight it so that people can see it. And Ann, the way, the way this would be, you could actually do a portion of that in freshman English. Like uh -huh portion of that in sophomore English uh, you could do it as you could do it by having kids take any of these courses you could do it again uh, by competence like a so. nine weeks in communications or whatever correct okay on the the next one the computer science thing we have never defined it and I don't want schools to think they have to offer a coding class if like network security or something like that's available how do we make that clear okay I think we, we, we need to do that, but I want to, I think even today what would get to that is advanced technology could easily be your networking class, even if it wasn't classified as a computer science. Well, is that defined anywhere, though? I don't think advanced technology is defined anywhere, is We would it? give a listing of, uh, people could submit that to us, I mean. Okay, so we'll develop a list of classes that would fit the STEM elective. Yes. Okay, with by course code and that kind of thing? Yes. Okay. We'd have to do that by course yeah. code. I think there's a difference between kids say they want access to something and they want to be required to take it. I had a lot of kids say, yeah, I'd like to learn how to change a tire or do that kind of stuff, but to put it as a graduation requirement when there is absolutely no definition anywhere in anything that we have and we have no standards for it is just an unfunded mandate to the schools because we this starts next fall. Well, we don't really have four years to put it together. That needs to be available to the kids who are going to be freshmen next year so they can get it out of the way their freshman year. Otherwise, if we don't do something with it in a formal way and define it so everybody actually knows what it is, um, they're all going to be doing it their senior year. I would rather see us work on a life skills elective but not require it because we don't know what the heck it is. And as we were discussing, you know, what life skills look like in Highland Park is different than Blue Valley. So, um, like I said, kids want it. Kids never told me they wanted it required. And there's a big difference in that. And I've never heard the, skill, the schools or any superintendents say, yeah, we'd like you to require that, especially since we don't know what the heck it is. So, to me, it's just an... We can, we can hold off on this and be okay and add it as an elective later, but not a requirement now. And if we did that, we could go back to a half credit there, back to four and a half IPS and be back to 21 so we don't penalize the kids in alternative schools and in foster care, because I think 21 is probably plenty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One of the things, Mr. Chairman, I just point out, there's nothing that says you have to start with the class of 2027. You could start with the class of 2028, which would be this year's seventh graders, if you wanted, if you wanted some time to put. That's the earliest you could start it is the class of 2027. Yeah, Just, but I think the other stuff is valuable enough. We need to get moving on it next year if we can. Or we could say that this, that that. I would think we could say that that becomes part of the requirement whenever the standards are developed. But then you'll have, you mean for that class? For that class. So it wouldn't start next year. But that's why I'm saying we don't have to make that decision today. We can just leave it out and when we get it developed and we like it, 
then we could add it in for whatever class that would go with, if that makes sense. Like, let's say we worked on it next year, and we developed a life skills standard that we thought every kid ought to have to graduate, then we could add it for the class of 28. But frankly, I, life skills is different all across the state, and, and so mandating something we can't even define at the last minute just, I think, makes us look a little irresponsible. Ma'am. Well, Michelle is next. Okay. just wanted to jump in and say that I don't think that the intent was to create a brand new life skills class here. What students said in the survey was they wanted a class that they termed Adulting 101. And that could have been any number of things. It was how to change a tire and cooking and how do I apply for a job and what does it look like to get my first apartment. The things that are causing them angst as they arrive at the end of their high school career. And so I think that the conversations that were had around this life skills, you'll, you'll notice, I mean, it's life skills slash financial literacy. That is a standalone class. Standards for that do exist, but the curriculum and the way that it's taught varies from district to district. And I've talked to parents who say, I don't want my kid to take a financial literacy class. That's, as a parent, I want to manage that for my student, so I would rather see them taking something else. If that's the case, what this one credit does is it allows them to maybe not take that financial literacy piece and instead plug in a couple of facts classes. They could be, these would be classes we, we could do this with classes that already exist right now. So if you want to take you know, a facts class where you can learn how to cook, then that qualifies under this category. And I just say there's a difference between kids saying they want to have access to it. I never heard a single one of them say, yeah, you ought to mandate it for me. When I hit something while I go ahead and erased everything, I think you were on the list. Thank you, Chairman Porter. So, so Randy, just ex can you explain like the five um, credit hours of IPS choices, emphasis on career path? Is that something that they, it looks like it's, that's a mandate as well. It's new. That, that's an, well, it's, it's an elective, they're electives. They're all electives. Yeah. So. Just give me an example. Just give me yeah, an example. Yeah, but, the, but what, the, what the task force wanted, there's been no change, Michelle, from that. They simply really look at what the student wants to do with those electives and the family and make it valuable for them. But that, that, that's why the emphasis, but it, they're electives. Okay. Yep. So I'm still a band director. Three of those electives can be after I get my fine arts credit for the next three years of band. That's correct. That's what you want to do, sure. So we seem to be, I, I'm, I'm picking up, and correct me if I'm wrong, we seem to be, uh, in pretty much agreement, except uh, on the uh, life skills slash financial literacy section. Would that be an accurate statement right now? And so how do we rectify that? Janet, did you have a question? No. Okay, all right. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, it, it almost seems like we could reach a solution if instead of saying the class of 2027, it was put forward to 2028, which allows you to, allows us the opportunity to map out and, and resolve any issues. I have a question. So let me, let me, let me pursue that a second. Okay. Uh, with a, uh, with a review at this time next year where we have to look at the, uh, give, give opportunity to develop those standards and kind of the, then we'll review it again maybe before it goes into full implementation. I'm sorry? I'm thinking out loud. Well, I mean, I hate to, to hold up everything else for this just because we haven't figured out what it is. And frankly, nobody's asked us, no, even the kids, to mandate this. But we could move forward with everything and go back to six there and do four and a half electives and the half of financial literacy. And then next year, if we want to, for the class of 28, add the life skills when we know what it is and are convinced it ought to be mandated, if that makes sense. But go ahead and move ahead with the rest of it for the 
class of 27, because I think it's really important. This is good stuff. And I'd, I'd hate to put it all off just because we had this thing come up at the last minute. I mean, this wasn't part of the original plan. This just kind of came up, oh, well, it, you know. And so. Um, and and I, I think I, I want to speak to this to the task force. And this was part of the discussion the task force had because it came out of the survey. So they did have lots of discussion on this topic. So the hang up is the definition of life skills. Yeah, that there is none and there are no standards. Janet? Couldn't the life skills class be pretty broad? Oh, it will be I extremely mean, broad. That's what I mean, extremely broad by being like if they took the foods class or the cooking class, if they took sewing. You, I could, mean, you could allow that to be defined okay. locally. Uh, in, a, in a very broad way. And I think each, even districts may have other classes that would maybe fall under a life skills I, class. Yes, I, I, I mentioned, and some already require that, and they call it different things. We have a school district that every nine weeks, they take a, a, a day or a half a day out of school, and they invite their community in and say, what skills do you have that you'd like to teach to kids? crocheting, uh, how to set a table, change a tire, I'm going to teach them how to fly fish, and the kids sign up. And then the next nine weeks, they sign up for different ones. They can't, they can't take the same one. That's just one way that they're doing it now without anything. Yeah. So it's going to be, I just tell you, if you go this way, if you, if you uh -huh. go this way, it's going to be really broad with a lot of discretion <coughs> to the local people to, to that's design. A, that's well, the other what problem, I other issue is going to be Size of school district, the availability to provide you know the services that you want. So as much flexibility as you can put in this is appropriate, because you've got schools with 35 in a high school to you know 2,600. You know, and there's there's only so many resources. So if you if you define something to the point where you got to do, that's probably going to defeat the purpose of that flexibility in that class. Well, I I, I just wanted to say that. I would think that there, it should be up to the local districts that if we establish the standards, and that's what she's talking about, we haven't established standards for it, I understand that, but it would be broad that, that so many of those things could all fall into uh, this, and, and I think that that school districts have them right now, that they could, they could be, they could be function, they could use that if they want to take it the first year, there's something they could take, they could accomplish that during the, I, I believe districts have these type of things right now, so. If I'm wrong, help me. <laughs> Correct me. My, my computer's gone rogue, so I don't. Check. I think <laughs> Melanie was next, and then the rest of you is gone rogue. So I'll, uh, you'll have to raise your hands. <laughs> I just want to say that we saw this yesterday um, when Britton was here and talked about the CAP class. That's a half credit. Every student in that district is required to take it, and they're using it basically in place of advisory to address their IPS I just plans. Took it all. So that would be an example of something that would fit in that category. And, and so, Randy, I was going to ask you, um, with regards to who makes this decision, this would be a local district decision. We would say you're looking for something that looks like this list of classes that would include the facts class, that CAP class, financial literacy, and then it's up to them to decide what fits in there, correct? Correct. I, I, I want to make one comment, though, because I don't want it to be misinterpreted by people listening. Facts classes would certainly be there, but there's a fact shortage in our state once you get out of the metro areas. I don't want rural Kansas to say you're requiring a facts class because that is an option that could be there, but there are many, many other options that would be a part of it. Well, I wanted to go a little bit further, I guess. We're not saying that we're going to teach them how to change a tire, how to cook a cake, how to bake a cake, how to, I mean, it's going to be much broader than that. They don't have to, we don't have to include all that into one class. I guess we're not dictating no. what that class would look like. No. Okay, I just want to make that perfectly clear because that would be local. But one of the recommendations of the task force was to give this back to the department so they could put the, the, the parameters, build the, the bumpers, if you call them, you know, so you can do it in here, but you can't do it out there. You know, they, they need some structure and support. 
The other side of the thing is, is like on financial literacy, I think, eight, Melanie, correct me if I'm wrong, which I hope you will, <laughs> like 83, 84% of the school districts already require in graduation or provide like financial literacy. Each one's probably similar but different by where they are and who's teaching it. Because on the other side, we don't have credentialing for that posi position. You know, so usually as a principal, I'm looking for somebody in the business department probably or maybe the facts department. And that's going to play a part in it. So if we build too structured a, 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 a requirement, we lose that flexibility for many of the schools that are under 300. <laughs> you know, so we've got to think about the range of schools we have as well as what we want them to do. You know, so it's the standards that we, we want to provide. And that's what we have want to give back to the district. Can, can, I, can I give you one where you can clearly see the crossover, all right? I'm going to go back to a post-secondary asset. Let's say you have a young lady who gets, who is recognized as the 4-H Kansas Key Award, which is the top level, not one person, but you can achieve that, and says, through that, I've learned these skills to, that was awarded that, and you could get credit for that in called life skills, and you could have do both. And now you're doing a post-secondary asset, a mastery of competencies, and you're getting awarded a credit. And that easily could be done if, if you take that action. But we also have to define as a parameter for schools what a post-secondary asset is and how you determine that. Right. We can't just leave it out there, well, I think this works. There's got to be some, no, and that's what we've asked that. the district, we've asked the department to do, yep. to bring back to us before we, we do that. But it's amazing, like on that one, how many districts are already doing it. Okay. Now, and you did it without our help. Now, my computer's been... Have I already called on you? I think you did. I'll, if you want to call Ann, then I'll wait. Okay. Okay, Ann. We're just kind of making this up on the fly. Like, well, it could be this. It could be that. Yeah, it could be all those things. But until we define it, we don't have any business putting it down as a requirement. We, Even amongst the group, we haven't even decided what it is. Is it a facts class? Is it this, is it that? There's no harm in moving ahead with everything but that until we get standards and a definition. And with financial literacy, we do have standards. They don't have to make anything up. They can take the standards we have and run with it. But life skills, I think until we figure out what it is, we can wait on that piece another year. Otherwise, it's just an unfunded mandate of some lobby thing. That's a technical term. Other thoughts? I think Ann's points are well taken. Uh, uh, we need to know what it is. This is going to go off again. It's turned color. So Melanie, let's try that with it. So is the um, is your proposal to uh, for oh uh, Okay. Come back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is to just take the life skills but have the financial literacy piece still there? Or just take that one yeah. credit out and give it? Do you have six IPS choices? I guess what's... Yeah, to go back to a half financial literacy or personal finance and then four and a half IPS so we're back to 21 and we're not endangering kids in foster care in alternative high schools. Yeah, For this year to get yeah, it going. I was just like, we're... Yeah. we're, we're Going after him, like, so what's the alternate? Because I don't want to go down to 20.5 and then go back no, to... No, 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 be 21. Yeah. Then. So, yeah. okay, thank you. With the understanding that we would come back next year with the definition and standards for life skills, with the, with the assumption that we will add that at, at that time. Ben? I guess... Hmm... I hate yanking districts around on graduation or credits year after year. I mean, how, how much does, I should ask from an open-ended question. How disruptive would it be for us to change graduation requirements two years in a row? I mean, I know this change wouldn't be major, but 
to have one class have one set of I graduation believe. standards and then have the next I believe. year have something so, different? Um, I, this is what I, I believe, that since I've been doing this work 41 years, <clears throat> there's been two changes to graduation requirements. The 1980s when increased rigor of nation at risk happened, and then the fine art credit that was added later on. So how disruptive? Like monumental, because we just don't do it very often. I mean, I, that's the truth. It doesn't happen very often. So um, now, you're not talking about a substantial change, so that's, I don't know, I'm speculating, Ben, but you don't change graduation requirements, or you haven't, uh, very often in my lifetime. And not only are you not talking about a major change, you're talking about one that is predicted because we're talking about it. Th that would be correct if you did it that Even way. at that, I mean, we have financial literacy <coughs> standards and no requirement. I mean, we can develop uh, standards for life skills and put them out there for schools to do as an elective, too. Okay, Jean. I think we have a, a group of students who are out there who have been through two years of dealing with COVID, and I, I hate to, to delay improvements to their education, but I was wondering if we might take the life skills part of it and just develop a list like we did with the post-secondary assets of, of options that districts might consider and, and, and uh, use that to begin this process this year so that maybe we could vote on it in December with having life, life skills uh, sort of delineated out with a list of things that might be acceptable options for that? Let me tell you what I think I heard, and you tell me what. Remove the half credit for life skills, but just make a list as part of the, okay, I didn't understand that. Leave it the way it is, but but provide a list of what constitutes life skills of things that we already have in our standards um, or options just like, like the post-secondary assets so that we had something to provide to districts that was gave them the parameters of how they might meet that but would be able to be uh, initiated earlier than, than continually waiting. Okay, so. thoughts? I like that idea because, like I said, I, I think that really, you know, part of what we talked about as a task force was the shifting taxonomy of the way that we categorize these different classes. And so you see at the top of the screen it says STEM and math and science fit right under that heading. And so there are classes that already exist in this life skills category. We don't have to create a brand new class to fit this. So I, I like the idea of pulling a list of existing classes that schools are teaching. And I mean, this is just, it's another elective category and financial literacy fits in with that. So I appreciate the flexibility of that category. And the list would of course be dynamic because you're gonna, you can change, you can add to it any time. Uh, Betty and Ann. I really was giving some thought to Ann's suggestion and it wasn't so much going against the idea of, of life skills. It's indicating that, you know, it's a good idea, but why would we mandate that? Why wouldn't we allow um, to put that option in place for students where they can make that choice? So I'm kind of hearing, and, and help me if I, I think I'm hearing you correctly, you're not opposed to that. It's just let's not make it a requirement leave it there as an option for uh, those students to take. And I, I reflected over that and I like that simply because I don't like making decisions to try and fit in a box. It, it, it bothers me when I got questions and I got concerns, uh, but I'm making a decision that's going to impact students. I love life skills being there, no doubt about it. Um, there's, a, there's great value there, but I 
do agree with Ann that it could be there without being a requirement. So what do we have to do to move forward? I could just follow up on what Betty said. I mean, if all we're going to do is make a list of classes so they're already out there and nothing new, then it's just an elective kids could already take. There's no need to make a requirement. Does that make sense? If we came back next month with a list of classes that are already available, we haven't made anything new in life skills. They're just electives kids could already take today. So anyway. So you probably, to move forward, need a motion to either do this or do something else. So you just want a motion? I want something. Yeah, I want a motion, but I want a motion where we can effectively move forward for the benefit of kids. And, and we have a, we have a, hitch here that uh, well it's not a big hitch I mean people either like this or they like what I said so you can make a motion and vote it up or down you want to yeah. Did you have I'm not question? sure I like that what you just said not that I, I we won't come to that point someday what do you I don't understand what you mean I mean either we can vote on this and approve it or we could make a motion that's different than that and vote on it if we're ready to vote. That's what I'm saying. Oh, you're not ready to vote? Okay. <laughs> I just this, is, this is too big to uh, uh, walk in, and we've been discussing this for like 20 minutes, but we've been working on it for over a year. Right. But I just sense in the conversation that we're not together. I mean, this is not something we, we need to. But we're really, much really agree. close. I mean, we're, to get down to a half. I don't think credit, we're really, really close. Really? Oh, okay. Because I thought this was the only thing really that was. Yeah. No, I'm just saying. On, yeah. You know, yeah. It, yeah. we're, we're not close keeps, on this issue. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, anything we do is really substantive. Mm -hmm. You know, so when when even a little move. You know, is 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 gigantic. It's going to affect people tremendously. Well, all I'm saying is Near go and back far to what, all I'm saying is go back to what you guys originally brought us I'm, in this category I'm of employability aware. and life skills, where it was six credits, a half, a half, a half, and four and a half. I would prefer to vote on that than than this one with the seven. Jean's trying to been trying to talk yep, for a sorry. while. Let's give her a chance. That's okay. I think that the point of having these graduation requirements is to help students be ready for whatever comes after graduation. And I believe that a lot of times students are unsuccessful because they don't have those life skills. Whatever they may be, wherever they live, they're going to be different whether you live in a rural remote area or an urban area. And so I like the flexibility of letting districts pick uh, a curriculum for that to meet that, that that applies to their area. But, and I, I think these kids that are in, in our schools right now need more than ever to, to have this addressed before they leave so that, that they can go on and be more successful after they graduate. I think having you know, a list of options that can be added to um, allows, that, allows for that and uh, it, it'll really help these kids uh, while they're in school and after they go on. How long does it take to develop standards? A year fast would be a year. Now, so, I say that in some cases, and Joyce can probably help me, there are model standards that we use sometimes where we don't to start from scratch and develop, but we take other national standards and then we look at them. But we'd have to get groups of teachers together and people, so it's going to take a while. So if we, 
So that if we were to approve this as it is for the current seventh grade class, with the understanding that before it goes into effect by the end of next school year, we have standards to operate to. To I've seen if anyone upstairs on six fours text to me like, what? Uh, what did you just say? Uh, well, I'm not, saying that, call I'm, for anyone I'm not saying that we've got to have it for the 1st of December this year. I, I know that on the mastery of competencies, I had talked to David, if you pass something, to have something to you by the summer. I mean, that was our goal, to have something, you know, before we started the school year. That would be our attempt, you know. Uh, we would do our best to do whatever you want us to do. So if we were to do this for the current class of, of seventh grade class, that would give the rest of this year and part of next year to develop those standards. Is that reasonable? I think that could be done. You'd want something by the, by the end of first semester next year so that people could prepare for that. Michelle? Thank you, Chairman Porter. So fi for life skills or financial literacy, when I see financial literacy, I guess I'm thinking older. I'm thinking personal finance, class, you know, accounting class, I'm thinking older. When you guys are talking seventh grade and then you're talking life skills, I'm, no? Oh, I'm sorry. This you can be so. easily be confusing. I think what we're saying is it wouldn't go into effect <laughs> oh, until, the, until okay. this year's seventh graders graduated Got high school. Got it, okay. Oh, they, we're talking about high school I was, I thought. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So like the life skills, I'm, and again, I think of that, I think of almost every, well, not every school, but a lot of them have home economics. They have yes. bake, they have cooking. And, we already have and in, our, <laughs> in our faith-based schools, it would be part of their faith. Yeah. So we already we basically already have that, and we leave it up to those s local districts to set those standards. Correct. Those well, as as we would correct the broad standards, but in terms of the curriculum and the courses and how they met it, yes, you're correct. So they could actually have a standalone personal finance class or a standalone. That, that that's could be what you want. Those are all electives. So it's Correct. Whatever that, whatever that school decides. Correct. You could also, through competency and mastery, earn those credits as well. It doesn't, don't, that's one of the big things that comes out of this, is it doesn't have to be a class that's a semester or half a semester, but it's credit, and they can get, the, they can attain that credit I fear through lost other top, other I pathways. I fear to have lost control. I think you have. I want to say something. Else. Melanie again. I feel like we are really close. Um, I, I want to go back to Jean's idea of getting that list together. I think if we could see the list and bridge this gap. Life skills was a moniker that came out of the conversation that was started by the student surveys that said Adult Team 101. And they were very specific in the types of skills that they, they weren't saying we want it to be required. And I, I think if you asked them, what do you want to be required? They'd say, well, not much of anything. Um, so it wasn't about making a requirement. That conversation came out of the question that we asked, which was what skills would you like, what, sorry, what classes would you like to see added? What classes would you like to see removed? That was the same survey where those same students told us that the thing that they wanted to see go away was PE. And so I think if we go back and, and look at that list, there may be a way to get to a place where we can pass this as it sits. Because remember, the legislature wanted to legislate both computer science and financial literacy as possible requirements. And so I think it's, in, sorry, personal finance, thank you. Um, so I think it's important to keep it on this list if there's a way to do that and still create some flexibility for those kids to make some choices inside of it. And again, I really liked what we saw yesterday with the CAP class. Yeah, um, all I'm saying is, if all you're gonna do is produce a list of classes we already have, that's nothing new. They can already take that as elective. They, they can, but it's that conversation around well-rounded. I mean, they, they can take as many math classes as they want, but we require three. And so this would be encouragement to choose some classes within a specific category that will help them with life after high school. Janet. To Jean's point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But Randy, in addition to taking a class, couldn't this be earned through scouts? Yes. Through uh, campfire through four. I mean, yes. any anything that's so necessary. They don't necessarily take it to class. So Correct. Well, there could be other ways that students could get this. And yes, I think these these options could be listed also. You know, on the options. Uh, I, <laughs> on distance. this area, though, the options would have to be 
examples because the yeah. options are endless. Oh, it's true. On this, in this area. True. Okay, but anyway, I just want to make yeah, it clear. But I think, I think this is too important an issue not, to not include. I mean, that's the way I feel. I mean, I think it's very. If the kids want it, then we need to listen to the kids sometimes. So what about, Mr. Chairman? I, I did ask Joyce. She said, Randy, we can do this in a year, and she'd like to be a part of it. So don't want to speak for her, but that's what she told me. And uh, so that she she does these things all the time. So it looks like a year if you wanted to go to the class of 2028, is that seventh grade? That that could be doable within the agency if that's what you wanted to do. What well, would be... Uh I'm, I'm throwing out something else. Let's, if we could approve this as it is, then and it becomes effective with the eighth grade class on the day that the standards are adopted. So we do it, you know, we we approve this as it is, and then on the and then next March we adopt the standards it becomes effective with that eighth grade class. If we wait till the next year, it becomes effective with, the, with that class. But we, we move off of this. Does that make sense? That is doable. That may be a little more complex for school districts to understand versus setting the class up, but it is doable if that's what you want to do. Okay, here's another option. This, this is to... This is too important. Melanie. Can you go back to the very first one? Sorry. Can you go back to the very first slide? Uh, the very first slide. Oh. That one. The recommendation. <laughs> um, wanted to take another look at this because there was also the define what constitutes the awarding of mastery and competency. Um, yes. Which is a piece of this. I... I'm inclined to make a motion to move forward with the one change to the list as presented. Which one? To, take, Which one? to strike the life skills slash financial literacy requirement and move us back to 21 credits. And then if we're looking at establishing a committee that would then review these, it's something that could come back when the standards have been completed for that life skills component. So you so, are taking the financial literacy out also? Mm -hmm. I can't support that. Yeah, I don't know. Just strike the half. Okay, we could strike the half. Uh, did I misinterpret what you said? I was thinking we'd take the whole line, but okay, we could just no. take the half. It's, uh, take the half credit of life skills and keep yeah, it, so we'd be uh, at 21.5. It, uh, I'm going I'm to show what Ann is yep. saying, if you don't mind. She's saying do this. Category. And this becomes 4.5. Yeah. And the 7 becomes the 6 at the top. Then we're back to 21. Is that good for the class of 27 the kids will be who are eighth graders now and then at some point are we going to discuss requiring life skills mm -hmm. I think we ought to still move ahead on developing those standards because <clears throat> kids want it and we can develop it so this would be a temporary knowing full well that we are going to re revisit this in a year mm -hmm. you ready to make a motion make it I move that the Kansas State Board of Education adopt new course classifications for graduation requirements of 21.5, nope, 21. of 21 One. credits. Could I offer something? Absolutely. There are several components to this. Yeah. Yeah. And so you may want to, you may want to say as presented, because you've got, you've got the mastery. Yeah. You've got the post-secondary yes. assets. You have 
you have the courses now that I've changed here, so it's and reflecting. It, so it's as presented, okay. Right, it's reflecting. And then you have the FASA, FASA and you also FASA. have the committee. And the committee. Okay. I mean, that's, that's the proposal in its entirety. And so if that's what you like, I, I might suggest making your motion to this, and then if it doesn't pass, then we could rework something else. Randy, so before, before I make also, my motion, I'm gonna pause. Sorry, you would wanna change the six credits to five on the left column. Oh or yeah, five units of electives. The, wasn't there another one that would need to change? Or no, that was the present yeah. system. Right. right. Never Where mind. it says Sorry. six electives, you need to change that to five. Oh, it's right. That's right. right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought it was a summary. You're right. Okay. Reading it wrong. Sorry. So I, I made the change. So what is in front of you now, if adopted, is what would happen. If if not, then now the motion is for all elements. And was that seconded? Betty seconded that motion. Any further discussion? All elements excluding life skills. That's our yes. just like that. Which is all elements, including excluding life skills. Excluding life skills. Ready to vote? Yes. Ben? Um, right. Ben? I, I guess the concern that I have, and I, and I, 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 I don't know a better option, so I think probably the option that we have is probably the, the best one, but having to 21, with the shift internally and then coming back a year later and then jerking the next graduation class with another thing creates a lot of turmoil when we don't change graduation credits very often. I guess that's my only, that's my only concern and maybe having the standard, I'm all for having the standards adopted, I think we can, but maybe having model standards for a while and then when we actually do another sweeping change uh, that we do comprehensive change instead of piecemeal graduation changes. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the herky-jerky. Like, we're gonna change graduation requirements every other year. Because then you have three different tracks of kids, because this is gonna go affect the next year's kids, and then the next year's class will have different ones. So for two whole years, you'll have three different graduation requirements in a high school. And for counselors to keep track of that, not that they're impossible to keep track of, but with IPSs and everything, that's a lot to think about. So if you're gonna move it for next year, you're gonna have two years with three different sets of graduation requirements. Am I right in that, Randy? Because <coughs> you'll have your juniors and seniors would, on one track. That would be correct. And then you'll have sophomores on another track and then freshmen on a whole other yeah, graduation so your, plan. So your course guide selection would have three different graduation requirements depending on the age of so the child. So going up to 21.5 credits then, ultimately? I mean, I guess I guess that's just a concern that I have just for the future. I'm, I'm supportive of this. I just... Um, to have more space, probably if we change it, to have a little bit more time in between the changes, but um, those are just, that's my input. Betty. And I like, I mean, if, <coughs> I don't see it as changing twice, if that's left as an elective, right? It would be what we've adopted now, but giving more options for the class of, of uh, 28 as, a, as an elective. And it's not, and it's not, yeah, life skills. And it's not, um, you know, pulling them around. It's just clarifying what could be electives for 2028 if we looked at it that way. This is adopted. Clarify 2028 electives and leave it as this. Dina. If you are leaving life skills as an elective, there's no guarantee it will be offered in any school district because it's an elective and it will be up to the school <coughs> whether they offer it or not. So if our intent, it seems to me if our intent is that be included at some point. It would be better to wait until we have the, we know we could have standards by next year and we could say it's a seventh grade class when it, be, when they move into high school that will, it will take effect 
instead of saying, well, we'll just sort of wait and see if it comes to pass. Because that to me is a little wishy-washy. So I prefer, if, and I think the life skills is a, because I was on tour with Dr. Watson, and we mentioned that, to, and with Jean, we mentioned that to students, and they thought it was a great idea. So what they had in mind were life skills may be different than what we were thinking, but it seems to me that there is an interest in with students. And it would seem to me if we're also if we're concerned about students who are in alternative schools, many of them that I remember having in class, seeing them as adults, many of them could have used a life skills class that would have assisted them in knowing more about how to proceed with their life. So I'm not so sure that all of that, that we maybe need to make sure that life skills is, is up there. One of the things that, that I would remind the board of, when we go out and we hear from students, to remember, you're hearing from a fraction. If I were to uh, put that on a sample, you haven't heard from everyone, you haven't got enough of a weigh-in for all students across the district. There is, no one is negating the fact that there isn't value in life skills. It's being able to move forward with what the committee has done, allowing us the flexibility, instead of being divided, agree on what we can agree, let them come up uh, with the span of time to develop, and if we need to do something, which was the reason that we were looking at a review committee, because if you think that we can make something where there will never be any changes, then to me that's living in a dream world. Education is always changing. And it's for those that well, don't want to make the change that have no idea what a computer is about or the value of technology. We will always be changing. So you got to get rid of the notion that we just got to make something that's going to last for 100 years another hundred years, if we do that, then we are being a great disservice to our students because we are not understanding that change will happen whether you like it or not. So I'm, I'm really foreseeing, I guess, uh, I like what was presented. I think that, that this is a good step forward. Uh, and I think that we, we should look at it from that standpoint and not, well, I had 50 students or I had 100 students when really across the state, uh, that's just a, a, a drop in the bucket. So change is going to happen. We have to recognize that. We have a motion on the floor. We're ready to vote. Uh, yes. I have a suggestion. And, and this suggestion is to the chair and to Dr. Watson. We've talked about a lot of the different issues and what elements of what we're about to vote on. I would like to get in the record, what are we voting on? Okay, I, I mean, okay. We, we, so to I go wanna, through, let me recap, for recap you. The, the requirements that we're going to vote on. Okay. Just to make sure everybody hears the same thing and it's on the record about what we're going to do. This is, this is huge. And, I, and not that I think anybody's gonna bail out on us, but uh, well, I didn't vote for that. You know, this is what we're voting on. 
this is going to change schools and change lives. You know, so we need to make sure we know exactly what we're voting on. So, Item on? one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you would charge the department with developing what constitutes awarding of credit based on mastery and competency using specific examples in school districts with a strong focus on the individual plan of study. I'm paraphrasing this. We would bring you back something by the summer in this area, handbook. That's item number one. Item number two, that students would have to graduate from any high school with, the, with whatever the, our credits plus theirs and two or more post-secondary assets taken from this combined list. Which is also dynamic. That's correct. The courses as, so that's, that's area number two. Area number three. The courses of study would be three and a half units of English language arts, a half a credit of communications, three units of social studies, one unit of fine arts, no change from the current standards there, or current requirements, three math, three science, one STEM elective, a half credit of PE, a half credit of health, half credit of financial literacy, and four and a half elective choices through the individual plan of study, totaling 21. That's the third area. Fourth area, that students would take the FAFSA, FAFSA unless they opt out, their family opts them out, or the school says, uh, we don't believe that's appropriate for that student. And the last, that's, and the last area would be to set up a review committee that once these go into effect, would bring you back any recommendations that, that because we've seen unintended consequences and there may need to be changes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're ready to vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? Abstain? Eight, one, and one. Thank you. I'm going to thank the committee and thank you for your deliberations. I apologize to those of you who are in the audience, but we've been at this a long time. We're going to take a break, and we're going to be back at 3.15. <laughs>
part of the meeting. So, uh, so Denise, I believe you have a young man to yes, introduce to us. Thank you so much. Well, as, as part of our opportunities to bring you all student success, uh, today we have the privilege of hearing from Jackson Bevan. He's a fourth grade student at Northern Hill Elementary School in the Seaman School District, which is right here in Topeka. According to Jackson's mom, he has always loved tearing things apart to see how they work with particular interest in vacuum cleaners. His big dream of inventing robot vacuums has led him to open his own business. Today, Jackson is going to tell us a little bit about himself, his interests, and what it's like to be a business owner at the age of 10. Joining him today are lots of folks. We have Jackson's family back in the corner over here, Jackson's parents and grandparents and cousins, and we have several representatives from his school. We have his teacher, Mrs. Rebecca Unruh, and we have his superintendent and principal, as I understand it, from the school as well. So we are going to turn this over to Jackson. Hello, my name's Jackson, and it's nice to be here today. Um, Last summer, we went to a vacuum museum in Missouri, and you could, the guy had tons of vacuums from 1901 to now. You could use them, and that was a blast for me. And so I tried some of them. I asked him questions, and we did a lot of other stuff. When I was three, I loved using our big Bissell, and I would try to go everywhere with it I could. I'd vacuum the floor, the couch, and just mess around with it. And then we got a lighter vacuum, which I used because I could do it more places, and I was a little bit older. And we used that for a long time. Once I was in first grade, I invented a toilet plunger out of an old cookie can, a paper towel roll, and a little bit while after that, I made a trumpet out of PVC pipe and a water bottle. Once I got a little older, I started tearing apart computers and comparing their different parts and their insides and seeing what the difference between the brands were. Then I decided, well, since I like vacuums, I guess I'll just start vacuuming cars. So I decided to vacuum cars, and I saved for my first shop vac. And then I decided I'll make a business. So I decided to save for a Dyson. And Dysons are the best to me because they look different than all the other vacuums. So I finally got enough money for that. And today I still like inventing and creating things and ripping things apart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really neat. Uh, tell me, what are your what are your plans for the future? Um, to create a bigger business and make home appliances. Oh, very neat. And where do you live? Um, I live. I don't mean your address. <laughs> <laughs> I live on Fifty Eighth Street. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Anne. Okay. Anne and Melanie. What's your favorite vacuum? Um, probably Dyson's. It's mine. And Titan's. I do the vacuuming at our house. My mother was a crazy vacuumer. She made me vacuum everything all the time. <laughs> so I, hey, I really, I, I empathize, and yeah, I, I, I did a lot of vacuums. Yep. How to repair them and tear them apart and mix parts. So yeah, good for you. I thought I was crazy. I guess we're both crazy. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So I just want to know if you figured out a way to keep the dog hair from tying everything up around the roller. Yeah, so there's actually some vacuums now that, like, they cannot tangle hair. They, they don't get tangled till like, 14 inches. Wow. Hair. Cool. I got to get one of those. <laughs> Melanie? I just wanted to ask you if there's a particular inventor or somebody that you look up to. 
somebody um, you might want to be like. I look up to mostly James Dyson. Fair enough. <laughs> Should have seen that one coming. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Angie. Could you talk a little bit about what you're doing in the pictures that are up right now? Um, so I was making, I was trying to make a water filter by running it through like a toilet float and then running to a bathtub faucet. And I was trying to just figure out the way how plumbing and houses work. Tell a little bit about your business. So you're repairing vacuums and you're doing car de detailing, correct, right now? Yes. Talk about the business side of it. How much business are you doing? How does how does one of these people get in contact with you, you know, if they've got something? Yeah, so after I was in the news article, um, a lot of people came in, and right now I'm, like, packed with people wanting... <laughs> My room, basically every corner of it has a vacuum now, <laughs> which the business side of it is also kind of complicated because you have to make sure that you don't accidentally do something to someone's vacuum or break it or do something. So you got to make sure you always return it like how it was and cleaned, which you can contact by my mom's phone number. <laughs> and car detailing is also difficult because some people have really dirty cars mm -hmm. and it takes longer. Like one time I had a car that she had Huskies and she couldn't get the hair out. So I spent all day sweating and just in there trying to get the hair out. Well, I, well, I hope you charged a lot of money for that <laughs> detail. <laughs> Yeah, so that's basically what the business side of it is. And to my colleagues, there's a possibility by the time he's in high school, he has done some things to get credit. <laughs> I would think so, yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you. Now, sometimes we like to take pictures with really neat people. So would you mind having your picture taken with all of us old people? Sure. <laughs> By comparison.
some reactions that we might want to consider uh, for past legislation. After that, who wants to talk business, right? Yeah. <laughs> who wants to talk about the fun stuff? Um, so in your folders should be a draft copy uh, of legislative positions. Um, just a general overview, we removed items from last year that were accomplished, which as Dean and I were going through, they were kind of impressed on how much actually did get kind of resolved last year. Uh, one, and on, one way or the other. One way or the other. I mean, we got some unwanted gifts with it too, but um, that we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, So we removed uh, those, and then at the very end, uh, we put member recommendations, things that Dean and I received from membership, uh, which is underneath there. So uh, it's a general overview um, of the document. Uh, there's nothing substantive uh, really in the document um, than what, what we had there last year. We did on under oh, yeah. health and safety issues add to the all efforts to reduce the opioid epidemic in Kansas mm -hmm. by adding, including making fentanyl test strips legal so we can mm -hmm. save people. Yeah. Yes, sir. <coughs> On funding. I believe last year for dollars for upgrading school safety in terms of uh, locks and doors mm -hmm. and windows. And is that expected or um, the dollar amount, is that what we want? <coughs> we want it, are we supporting that in here? So the funding issues stem off of what we voted on in July, which is the board's recommendation to the governor. That we voted on July, so that's where all of our funding recommendations came from. So it's whatever we voted on then. Okay. But in, in terms of non-funding, just legislation that would uh, support, help, or encourage uh, uh, making our schools safer. Okay. I, you know, I'm, so I'm would it be expanding the Safe Schools grant? That, that could increasing yes. it. On, it could be, but I know schools are still struggling mm -hmm. with you know. Um, just the issues of locks and doors and windows and, you know, uh, cameras and, and I just think maybe even from a political view we should have that in here in terms of uh, encouraging all schools to reach some level of safety uh, protocols and, and devices and, and the schools. Because I, I know maybe you've had the same experience. I've gone to schools and they have the automatic latches that can, and then others, it has to be a person that comes. And it has to do with finance and which is best, I don't know. And but many school, many of the superintendents have talked to me about the multiple, multiple district door, doors into the building and windows that need to be secured well, in, a, in a more. And there's also an issue with classroom doors that yes. do not lock from the inside. Yes. So that's another one. Also, I've had uh, issues with uh, glass on entranceways. You know, I may have a glass door. There's levels of glass that you can put in there. And, um, some have, I don't know, talk to me about they, they'd like to have better glass in there and this stuff is all real expensive but uh, anything to help them secure their schools and, and secure the, the folks that are in there. Yeah, we could certainly add a line item to express what the board voted on in July regarding okay. the safe and secure Thank you. safe and secure schools grant all right. uh, for sure because I know it is in our I was yes. confirming with Craig that it, we did have that in a recommendation okay. now his brain swimming from Today, special education, but um, he was fairly confident that we did include a recommendation. Okay. Thank you. To continue that, anyway. Mm -hmm. Any other additions 
Anne? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was looking, I can't find the document, but when the, um, when Dr. Redcorn first came and they had this list of recommendations, one of the ones they wanted us to work on, and I was looking for the right name for it, but they wanted an indigenous education coordinator, somebody to work on, and that's probably not the right name, but they wanted, like we have the dyslexia person on KSDE staff, they were hoping to get somebody that would coordinate the curriculum development, the government to government, um, you know, MOAs and that kind of thing. And I, do you know, is there a better name for that, Randy? <laughs> I'll look, I'll get the right name for it, but it was a position on KSDE staff to coordinate indigenous education. When we were issues. typing these, we weren't sure what the I know. correct mm -hmm. title was. You could was put Native American or whatever, so. but I, I think uh, we'll call it indigenous <clears throat> education since that's what's well, in Well, most. Our Am I correct that most everyone who works within a, um, a specific area of curriculum is a, considered a consultant? Or do we have other terms for them? We have other, other terms. Um, we have a variety of terms, but coordinator uh, could be appropriate. We can, we can get the correct term from our end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just make, we'll let you make sure it's the right term. Except Anyone oh, yeah. else? On that subject, yeah. uh, you know, it took three years to get a dyslexia coordinator whenever the current president of the Senate was the person that actually made the motion in committee. Uh, so that's that you know that that proved to be extremely difficult so I, I don't know how practical it is to make the, I mean I'm certainly not against making the recommendation I'm not sure how practical it is but I had a discussion with Alex this morning about uh, and ask him to to help us leverage funds through existing uh, funding sources and he had some suggestions that so you know, we may want to put this in there, but I think we don't need to that that we very likely need to look at alternatives too. We may be able to address this issue uh, without uh, waiting for the legislature. Well, and a lot of uh, the any kind of funding that we find may ask for a match. So we'll know yeah. more about that as well. And if you recall, every we made a whole bunch of suggestions through the Dyslexia Task Force. We made a whole bunch of suggestions for funding. And there were legislators on the task force. Uh, finally, after three years, they did approve the, the coordinator. But every other expenditure we handle through ESSER. I just... Uh, well, and the Dyslexia Coordinator was one of the things we got to take off of this, so... <clears throat> and one other question, and the first thing under academic support, remind me uh, why we came up with 12 hours. That was as a result of our meeting with the Kansas Board of Regents in September this year. Okay. So that's where the 12 came from. Because originally at one point we were discussing 15. It was 15. And then, right. and then at our September meeting it was, it was keyboards going for 12. Uh, and so aligning ourselves with KBOR we felt was a good recommendation to you. I mean, if you guys want to do 15, we can do 15. But it aligned itself with, it, it, with it, KBOR, and so it's a unified message. Okay, that's, that makes sense. I just couldn't remember. We couldn't either. <laughs> we have good note takers that we can go back and find notes for. <clears throat> Questions, comments? In the past, we have looked at these recommendations individually mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there's some of them that we will all agree on and there's some of them that all of us don't agree on. And we did that for the purpose of so, so whenever our legislative liaisons were meeting with the legislature, they could say, this request is unanimous from the Board of Education. This request is the majority of the Board of Education. 
to make sure that we don't misrepresent anybody that's in the minority. Mm. And I'm, or are you assuming we do that again today? Uh, it'll be for next month. Okay. Because we just presented it this month, and I, okay. I want to give people that, that time. I think it would be fair since they just saw the document this week. Yeah. Um, uh, versus getting it in yesterday and voting on it today. Um, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, again, there's not a whole lot of substantive t changes in there um, from last year. It was more eliminations than, than not. So, And our statement <clears throat> about how the, the support of the board talks about general consensus rather than majority or mm -hmm. um, or unanimous okay well I just wanted to make sure that that everybody at the table was properly represented yeah. mm -hmm. we at least chose that last year as a way of recognizing mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. there were disagreements on some things the other topic but we're coming upon session pretty quickly because you have December and then by the time the board meets in January, the session's already off and running um, uh, for the most part is, is these are positions that guides uh, your legislative liaisons as to what bills we submit testimony on and positions we take over there on various bills. These are not necessarily priorities, which we changed last year, that terminology because priorities you typically narrow down to some some asks and so that that could be a conversation that this board has we could have in December of, of asks that are on here that this is our top priority this is our second priority this is our third whether it be sped funding whatever it is that we prioritize when we do an ask that it becomes our top ask um, and this but this guides generally speaking so this is this is an, um, the most important document to use uh, in terms of the positions of the state board uh, in dealing with legislators and our partners. It's not just us, but our uh, education partners and organizations that are out there also use this document for for their guidance and, and, and that work too. And most of them are now, we are ahead of us. Yeah, but we're very much, this is very much in line with everybody else. Okay, and you still have weekly meetings with the during session, yes. Session. And we've, we've met consistently preparing for today uh, about, across the street. About a month, every month for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we've met. I think we took off May, June, and July. Either by Zoom or. No, we did take off May. Yeah. Took or, off June and July. That was it. Yeah, June and July. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Porter. So who are you meeting with again? Uh, legislators? Or did you say, what groups are you meeting uh, with? Educational uh, partners. They're like KSB mm -hmm. and PTA. It's a lot of organizations. Mm -hmm. Thanks. If I recall, there's a group when I was legislative, they was on the meetings on it's, Thursday afternoons or something yeah, like that. It's, it's about same. it's about it's fifteen a, to twenty people. It's the same group, mm -hmm. and some organizations have more than one individual. But mm -hmm. USA is another one. KNEA. Trying yeah, to think. Well, Topeka, Shawnee Mission, Olathe, yeah. Blue Valley. Yeah, yeah um, districts that have their own, the, KCK, uh, Wichita. Uh, the uh, bigger districts that have a lobbyist mm -hmm. will yeah. meet as well. If, if it's an organization that has an educational interest, uh, we typically meet with them. Are they including that group? Any other questions? Well, the next item, we've had two executive sessions to discuss uh, issues related to uh, legislation that we feel that we are implementing or that is not consistent with our mission uh, and uh, 
as we as we have discussed, because we made no decisions in executive sessions, we uh, we we used that time to determine what our options were. And at this point, we are going to open the floor for those specific issues, and then we need as a group to decide how we're going to respond to those. And I've asked Anne has the list, unless you have it, uh, and uh, I'm going to ask her to go through it point by point, and then we need to discuss it point by point. Somebody wake Ann up. Um, okay, the first, uh, I think the first thing up, I'm just actually just using what Craig gave us, you know, when he get, yeah. had the summary of the big bill. And the first thing that came up uh, was Let the- Let me interrupt you a second. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is Craig back there? Yeah. Oh, Can great. you report on today? Perfect. For, for for those of you that don't know, there's a there's a committee hearing today for the purpose of discussing special education funding. If I'm going to characterize what I think, because I've, I've kind of checked sometime today, uh, I'll be less diplomatic than you will be. Uh, it appears to me that the effort is to find ways not to fund special education. Uh, a lot of the questions were around, aren't we already providing that much money? And th there was never any uh, indication or accusation that, that anybody was not following statute. Everything's being done appropriately there. They have a legislative post audit that tells them that's the case. Uh, so it was more along the lines of, should the, is the statute as clear as it needs to be? Should it be something different? Is 92% the correct amount? And also, um, why isn't the federal government funding their share of special yeah, education? Well, I've asked that question for years. <laughs> yeah. They get an answer to that. And that's the list of additional questions after this morning. So, Okay. Anything else? That, that's a quick, hurried summary. I'm sure I didn't do it justice. Are they through? Or, or is that yes, it was a one-day meeting. They were only granted one day to meet. And the, uh, like I say, we've got some follow-up questions to provide for them as does legislative research and them will probably mean committees through the uh, uh, legislative session. The special committee was just meeting for one day. Okay, and I'm going to ask another inappropriate question. I have witnessed there have been times when people that have made presentations that support public education have not been treated professionally in some of those meetings. Number one, was that the case today? I did not see anything that I would have thought to fall into that category. Have you witnessed that? I have. And then one of the points that I've heard mentioned by, uh, by people in this department about the uh, overwhelming number of requests that we get uh, that uh, that are in many cases not even addressed. Uh, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I I, I think that maybe the, the board at least needs to be aware that if uh, if people for whom we are responsible are being treated in a manner that is inappropriate, maybe we need to discuss how to respond to that. I'm not asking you to answer all that, I'm just. Understood. Uh, because, because I've, I've I, well, first of all, I've been on the receiving end a couple of times, uh, uh, but I'm not there every day, some of you, and so I, I can handle it. Uh, but uh, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, we, I, I think it's our responsibility to make sure the people that, that work under our auspices are treated as professionals and treated with the respect they deserve and you all deserve respect. So. Thank you. And I doubt if I'm the only one here that believes that. And, and I would just say we have opportunities to visit with legislators one-on-one -on -one before and after meetings and so forth. So if, if we feel like there's been a misstep, we have an opportunity to make that statement. Okay, thank you. Now, Ann, 
Thank you. Maybe Craig can help me stay straight on the details, but um, the first one up was the um, Every Child Can Read Act, and I'm not sure how many um, details you want, but it says each school district must ensure that uh, they have this list of competencies, phonics, vocabulary development, reading fluency, and reading comprehension, which is our standards and what's on our website if you look at the dyslexia report. Each district has to measure student achievement through state assessments and other screening tools that are approved by the local board or KSDE, must provide targeted and tiered interventions. So it essentially says how schools are going to teach reading. They must ensure each third grade teacher communicates with the parents at least once each semester regarding the student's individual deficiencies and any recommended interventions for the student. Um, it requires the school district to annually report information regarding their implementation of the act to KSDE and uh, their interventions and their outcomes, the number of third grade students in the district, the screening data, um, <coughs> percent students proficient, and then KSDE has to annually submit a summary of such reports to the governor and legislature. And what part of that are we not doing? Well, we're not requiring these. I mean, we have set out, as I understand it, how schools are to teach reading, and they're to move to structured literacy. As far as the reporting, Randy, I don't know what data specifically to reading, other than state assessments, you require them, like, to report. So there's, I'm going to back up just a little bit on this because I think this, this is where one of the problems we get into. The federal government says you must have assessment in English, language, arts, and mathematics. We do. So does every state. That has a, a component, reading, but it also measures writing and oral communications. So... We don't have a reading exam, state exam. Oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, the reading exam, it's an English language arts exam that does encompass reading. So, and I just wanted to take that because mm -hmm. I think that's really important for the board to remember. Uh, we report to them um, every school district's um, scores on the uh, report card accountability report uh, that we released it in January, and it has their last year summary. Then it has a three-year look back, so it has the current year, and then two previous years, and that that data is disaggregated. Are you talking about to the feds or what we put no. on our website? No, this goes to the legislature and to the governor, and it's also on the public its public website. So we send that in a file format electronically. It's, we. You can get that. Anyone can go to that now, pick the school district they want to look at and pull that up. Um, and if you'd like, I can show you an example of that. Um, but that's what we produce now. And I'm looking at Craig just because there's there may be other things, but but that's primarily within that act what we currently do. And what school does not communicate to third grade parents what their children are doing in reading? That I don't know. I don't think we, we don't ask that question currently, right, Craig? Correct. Yeah, this says once, uh, once each semester regarding the student's individual deficiencies and any recommended interventions. Of course, by third grade, I mean, our position is that's too late. You need to be doing that, and that's why we require yeah. screenings earlier. So I guess my position would be we have a better plan than this that we implement, started implementing in 2020 and that we agreed to with legislators and educators and have moved towards structured literacy. So I think we have a great plan. Um, I mean, if they, I guess if they want a report, they already get a report. But I'm um, whether or not we want to make districts report this other stuff to us. So the only thing would it be helpful to to show you what we currently report? Well, let me ask you this. This is what they want um, the districts to report to us, and you can tell me if they already do. The school district's interventions and outcomes of the interventions, the number of third grade students in the district, the screening and assessment data the district is using to evaluate student progress in literacy, 
and the percentage of all students and student subgroups who are proficient, moving toward proficiency or deficient, which is, I don't know if it's problematic or not, but we don't use the term proficient, so, except for the feds. And using the word proficient goes back to the fact that we, we don't use that. Right. We don't have it defined. And that's another example that others are delivering the message, not us. Yeah. I would assume they're referring to the federal definition of proficient. So there's a lot, there's a lot in that that um, we, that is going to be thousands of pieces of data. Uh, so let me go through that. Let me show you, this is our website. This is the front page of our website. On it, and this is true of every school district, you have a button called accountability report. And when you click on that, it will come up three different kind of reports. But if you click on the accountability, here is every school district by the USD. So I just pick Nemaha Central, just down the road. And then you can pick what year. I'm going to pick 21. Um, and then here it is. Let's see if I can just make that bigger. So the first thing you're going to see is the demographics of that school district. Then you're going to see their star recognition. Here is their aggregate number of students at levels three and four in gold. State average is in blue. There's their post-secondary success, how much money they spend. Here's, I think, what you're asking in, and that is this chart. So you're looking back three years. You see this is the year that there were no assessments given because of uh, school. So you're going to see by January that there'll, there'll be another year added here, but then you can see there's free and reduced lunch, students with disabilities, African Americans, and it's by category, Hispanic students, and then their ACT score and the state average ACT score. And that's there for every school district. What I believe you're talking about you read the very first thing that's required for reporting. Could you read that again? School districts' interventions and outcomes of such okay, interventions. Okay, let's just stop there. School district mm -hmm. interventions could be tens of dozens per kid. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's what the law says. That we're that school districts are supposed to report. Well, I don't know how they would. I mean, I, that's. And let's say mention like <coughs> these are the resources and tools we use in general, not well, by they can, kid. Yeah, but, we can do that. But I think um, hopefully we're looking at that when we do accreditation. Like I said, we know that we've given them a list of structured literacy curricula, right, that we would support, and they are supposed to be using one of those. That is correct. So if they reported what structured literacy curriculum they were using, but now, if I we want you, them look, to. Craig's looked at this, this bill more times than he cares to. So, Craig, you may, I know we haven't spent a great deal of time on things that don't go into effect yet because our efforts have been on things that are currently in effect. But is there anything in there that I've misrepresented? The biggest difficulty in reporting right on the head, the interventions that you use. Uh, there's other reporting districts do um, around their annual plan that involves strategies that are used, but that's very different than the interventions you use with every individual student. Uh, that, that would be quite a challenge to be able to do that. So what, where do we need to go from here? How do we need to react? Any recommendations? 
I think we just keep on doing our literacy program that we have agreed to with the legislature and I think it essentially meets these requirements. I don't think there's, I mean, the use of phonics and. So what we are doing starts earlier and is more intense than what's they, what they're requesting. So well we're, we are like, we are, we we're are substantially ahead. in compliance. Mm -hmm. So we need to move on. Okay. Um, the next one was the alternative educational opportunities which we addressed today, I think, when we voted. Um, but what they, what they had asked for, um, that the school district has to establish eligibility requirements for sponsoring entities, like groups outside the school that would teach kids things. Requirements for the provision of alternative educational opportunities by sponsoring entities, procedures for a sponsoring entity to submit a proposal to the school to provide an additional educational opportunity to students, criteria the school district will use to evaluate the proposals and course credit that may be earned through that opportunity. Um, the bill authorizes a school district to accept a proposal from a sponsoring entity if that um, Opportunity provides additional learning through a work-based pre-apprenticeship, apprenticeship, industry certification, or community program is approved by us, complies with the school district policies, or is managed by a licensed teacher. The bill allows a sponsoring entity to also petition the state board to approve an alternative education opportunity that is provided through the sponsoring entity. So it looks like a lot of, and then, um, the district has to report information to us on those opportunities. So it looks like a lot of the bill focuses on districts working with organizations or others who want to provide learning opportunities to kids. They have to set up some criteria and figure out what they're gonna offer uh, credit for. But I think ours is a lot cleaner. I think it'd probably be helpful if we gave the same guidance statewide to what we would accept toward graduation. I, I think a lot of this, just to summarize, because that was a lot of info, unless you have it, I have it pulled up on my laptop, so I'm kind of following along. Essentially, it's what we already can do, have been doing for a long time. It just puts in a KSD -E bureaucracy. Would I be accuracy, accurate in that, Craig? <clears throat> I've, that's oversimplification, but it, it just creates a lot more steps to a process that we've had for decades. I think that's true, and probably that the key piece in this one section, uh, the word may is in place. A school district may do this. They may report. They may mm -hmm. allow this. So it's the local board gets to make the decision. So we actually, on the first part of our graduation requirement approval today, established a process for, for identifying and awarding competency-based base credit. So if that word says may, we're in compliance. Mm -hmm. Move on. This is going easier than I thought. The virtual school. Virtual school graduation rates. Um, says the bill amends the Virtual School Act to require a virtual <coughs> school's graduation rate to include only those students who enrolled in a virtual school with sufficient credits to be expected to graduate in the same school year as such students' cohort group. The bill requires that this graduation rate calculation be done only at the state level for accreditation purposes. The summary is they're asking us to consider two different graduation rates for virtual schools. And is that a requirement? Uh, I don't have the specific bill language. I just have the summary that she's going off of. But I think it is a requirement to shall. Yeah. And this steps on our responsibility to credit schools. Correct. Yes, it tells us how we're going to calculate graduation rates for virtual schools for accreditation purposes. I'm As I understand it, did we get that right, Craig? <laughs> I'm not suggesting this. 
but is there something is there something that would prevent us from making this consistent and give the same opportunities to the other schools so if you move into a school district if you transfer to another public school and you're behind in this as a sophomore uh, can we can we give the same? So I'm not suggesting we do it. I'm wanting to know, is so there something that would prevent us from doing that? If you're a freshman, you transfer to another public school district in Kansas that you, you would be counted in the new graduation rate. you have a half a credit. Mm -hmm. Well, yep. does that fly in the face, though, of how we're supposed to do it for federal purposes? Don't, don't we know. do That's it That's what same? I'm asking. Federal purposes say that once you enroll as a freshman, you have four years then to graduate it with that cohort <coughs> to be considered in graduation or a dropout. Every time you go in and out of school or transfer schools, then that transfer becomes, I used to be in DeSoto and now I'm in Eudora, and you transfer, and that becomes that school of record once you transfer to that school. This would prohibit that uh, with virtual schools. If you were behind. If you were behind in credit. Yeah. First thing you have to do is define who defines behind in credit. Mm -hmm. Is it, I, I use DeSoto and Eudora as the example, is it the DeSoto's Board of Education requirements, which may be higher than yours, or is it yours? Because, because you're moving, I mean, when you establish that across all school districts, you see how that becomes complicated. Uh, because every school district has different graduation requirements. What? Thank you. If you leave Blue Valley and they have higher credit, then you go down to Spring Hill and you're maybe there. There's a, just, just as an example, yeah. they, have a, they have a virtual school that's tied to their district. Right. Um, that's what I'm trying to figure out is, are we, is it the bare minimum of 21 or what? It's not, it's not defined in statute. So I think. So that means we can define it. Correct. I believe that's correct. I'm looking at Craig because. <laughs> well, I have a different question. Is this, since since the way to the cohort is part of the federal law, is this statute in conflict with the federal law? No. No, they're just saying this is how you're going to do it within the state for accreditation. So in, in Michelle's example. Right now, we would transfer that student from Blue Valley to Spring Hill. In this law, it says that student stays in the Blue Valley cohort even though they've left and gone to Spring Hill. And that's fine for the federal. The federal just says you got to put them in a cohort somewhere. So they would, under this law, it would stay in the school that they transferred from. What do we do with open enrollment next fall when people start moving around and then they can go back? They can go back to that prior distance. That's correct. So how are we going to keep track of that? <laughs> Very carefully. <laughs> this is part of the issue. Yeah. That's why we've always said, if you leave Blue Valley and go to Spring Hill, the minute you arrive at Spring Hill and enroll, you're a Spring Hill student. doesn't matter when you do it. You go back to Blue Valley, three weeks later, you're a Blue Valley student because that's the easiest way to do that, right, Michelle? It's, and so what you hear sometimes is, Right, Jim? Hey, this, this kid was in Mays and came into my school at Wichita Northwest in February and enrolled and then dropped out in March and it counted against me. That is true. That is true today. But to try to track any other way, you can see the problem in doing that. Even with, um, even with like, co colleges, and we're, that's what we we're, were trying to do with colleges. You have that dual credit or those, cre cre where do those count? You know, where do those, where do those credit hours count? And what universities are do they count? And, you know, so I'm just thinking about I started this here, and now I you don't even offer that there. I can't even take that. So it's like, um, can you? So they have to start at the beginning of the year, but then we have to look at all those credits and what's offered and what isn't offered because every district's different across the state of Kansas. And, what and they all offer. just to muddy the water, all our examples have been one Kansas school to another. What if the student's transferring in from New Hampshire? Excuse me. Or if the student transfers in from New Hampshire into my sure. virtual school. So for that, just to kind of bring you up to where 
conversations are so far, I think, and, and this is another team that's dealing with this primarily, um, in terms of whose credits am I falling behind on? The school you're going to is where you're intending to graduate from. So their credit requirements are what we're trying to match. So if I tra transferred from Blue Valley to Spring Hill, once I en enrolled at Spring Hill, what are their graduation requirements? And am I on track for the graduation or am I behind? And if I'm behind, then I don't count against Spring Hill's virtual school on Spring Hill's count, not what I was in Blue Valley. But the pertinent question is, whose responsibility is it to credit schools and is this going to be some, is this an area that we need to address? I think that's a legal question you just asked. So are you gonna answer that? No. <laughs> <laughs> So how are we going to address this? Are we just going to accept it? In my view, it is a, it, it, it's a. It's I, I would answer this. Accreditation has been found in, in legal cases to be that bullseye, one of the areas of the bullseye that Mark talks about that is the authority in the Constitution under general supervision of school districts. He's explained that to you. Accreditation of schools has been found to be that one of the areas. I mean, I'll give you the I'll give you the lawyer answer that you know certainly I'm not going to advise you in open session in a recorded situation to 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 do something that's contrary to the law. We're going to do everything that we possibly can to comply with the law, and um, I think it it needs to be reported and recorded that the agency will respond to any requests that the legislature makes and will try to do their best to, to provide and, and provide that information. So what this what this board may choose to do in terms of um, its legal strategies um, or um, actions that it may or may not take that are that could expose the board to to some legal challenge. I think those are more appropriate conversations to have in executive session and to discuss those those options, but I think that discussing in an open way the frustration and the difficulty in carrying out the letter of the law and discussing how the board currently meets or exceeds or um, <coughs> substantially complies or satisfies with the obligations of the statute is certainly appropriate so that we record that we're doing our best, we're trying to provide that information in some, in some uh, situations. It's, Simply, um, we're doing the best that we can with the information that's out there. And uh, so um, beyond that, I, I think it, it's, it's a challenge to provide a hard and fast answer to that. And am I correct in saying that what we're allowing is the, uh, the transfer of funds to virtual schools without accountability? Correct. Would that be an accurate statement? Whereas all we hear all the time is everybody needs to be accountable except for people that we exempt from being accountable, which may be private schools, which may be others. In this case, it's virtual schools. And they increase that per student fee quite a bit for, for those students as well. You know, this is an issue I'm willing to. Well, it begs the question, is the law unconstitutional? I mean, are we obligated to follow an unconstitutional law? Well, I can give you my opinion on whether it's unconstitutional, and I would do that, but uh, ultimately the court makes that decision. Right. But I, but I, so that uh, is, is something that could be challenged. Well, the other thing is this could be a big nothing burger. <laughs> I mean, we could do it this way for virtual schools and do it the way we already do it for virtual schools and see if there's any difference. Just monitor it and see what the difference is and see if there's any impact. But if there's a big difference and that say, for example, they were really so bad that we wouldn't accredit them or we would conditionally accredit them, but the legislature says no, they get a pass, then we might have something to talk about. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. We don't know if it's a problem or not. 
But we will after a year. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. I think that's it. What about the? Oh, the computer, computer science. science. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So. Um, too far. Okay, probably should have Dr. King around. Are you the computer guy, Craig? <laughs> um, let's see. First, they put some money into teacher training, which I don't think we have any problem with, but um, hold on. It requires um, districts to provide a computer science class, but it's not, as I understand it, actually very well defined. And I know uh, Dr. King was talking to some superintendents last week about they're going, are we providing it already or not? And there wasn't really a, a clear definition. Um, it requires us by 2023, July 31st, to review and approve a list of high-value industry-recognized credentials and a list of standard industry-recognized credentials as well. I don't think we've even talked about that, have we, Randy? I don't think we, we have people working on that from the agency. Well, that's, <coughs> that appears to me to be reasonable. Well, it says, okay, here we go. By the 2023-2024 school year, each secondary school operated by a school district has to offer at least one computer science course or submit to the State Board of Education a plan describing how they intend to offer a computer science course and in which school year that will be offered. And such courses are to be high quality, meet or exceed our computer science standards, be made available in a traditional classroom setting, a blended learning environment, or an online-based or other um, technology-based format. It requires us, on or before January 2023, and each January thereafter, prepare and submit a report to the governor and legislature on the progress made pursuant to this act. It's called the PAC Act. And it says what all, the number of secondary courses or schools that offer one or more courses, the number of high-quality professional learning providers that got grants from the grants that Dr. King's working on number of teachers teaching computer science courses, number of students reached by the high level, high quality learning providers. That sounds to me to be all doable. <coughs> With, if we want to say the it's okay for the legislature to tell the high schools what they have to offer, which I think is what we kind of just did today. I just want to interject one thing because you just made the same statement that a lot of people are assuming. It requires the secondary schools. Talking right. with legislative advisors, they confirm that's intended to be middle school and high school. It's not just requiring the high schools to do this. I mean, I think um, I heard Kansas took a huge jump in the number of computer science classes we were offering this year, but actually they just started counting what we were already providing. So I, there's a lot of fuzziness around what actually constitutes a computer science class to begin with. Maybe that's where we start on this one. So that's maybe we need to define that. Or hmm? Maybe we need to define that or have that defined. I mean, Don't maybe... I mean, last time we looked, 190 some districts were providing computer science or networking or you know some of those things. Don't we have model standards on it already? We do have standards. Yeah. And we have pathways. And by allowing on-site, blended, or online. That makes it available to all schools. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we just check and see first if we're already doing this. Yeah, I think everywhere. That's, I don't want to. I don't want any fights that. Yeah. Just to have a fight, but I. I mean, we we all agree we need more computer yeah. science. We just haven't defined it. And I mean, the 
at first, code.org said, well, it has to be one of these six coding courses. Now they've got a list of 22 courses. Maybe this year it's 40 courses, I don't know. But, but we get to make that list for us. Yes. So maybe Dr. King could, and that's what the superintendents were asking too. Okay, what are the courses that meet the requirement and that list hadn't been made yet? It sounds to me like on the first and second issue, we're in, com we're in con substantial compliance. On the third issue, we're gonna monitor that for a year and this one we're going to move toward defining what is a upper level. Well, we need to do that anyway because we've got yeah. a computer science graduation requirement and haven't defined it, so okay. we need to do that for our own purposes. So we may be okay. Might be perfect. But we need more information over the next year. Okay, Except I'm I think we that. have a report due January 2023. Yeah, but. which is not very far. No. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Randy. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I thought maybe you wanted to talk about math, the math uh, RFP. Have we, have we sent that out? Do we know a price? Because I know the minimum was $4 I, million. I've, I've asked if Beth is here for her to come down. That has started the process, <coughs> and I'm not exactly sure where we're at. Are we able to find anything that's similar, to, that's exact from that other state that's been in pro progress for five years? Because it had uh, to be like so specific, and then four million, and that's just a, that's just a starting point. Yeah, and, and Beth can give you more details because my update's about two weeks old now. Uh, but the RFP was sent out. We have received uh, proposals back, and I, I believe we've received eight proposals from seven different companies. So that's, and as I said, Beth can give you more details than that. And how does that compare to some of the other things that are free out there for, for children to use or students to use? Do we even yeah, know? That I can't tell you. I'd be happy um, next week's Friday notes, though, to try to give you an update on that, for all of you an update on where that is. Yeah, I just like to see comparisons as far as what are we saddling the taxpayer with on um, something like that when, I mean, was it thought through? Or was it thought through? Um, it needs to probably come through the Board of Education and then we can look to see what other things before they, they approve something like that and spend the money. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Dr. Yeah. Watson. Yeah. Is, is Beth coming down? Uh, I'm trying to. Get, I'm not getting anyone to respond to me, Denise. Well, except for that, we're substantially through. Which is if she's here, she's on her way. Which is surprised to me. I wasn't expecting. So the that. Math Nation thing, though, was we'll pay for this if you want to <laughs> use it. Wasn't that kind of how we wound up? I think and if so. you don't, you don't have to. Yes, I think. Okay. And it's possible that. Khan Academy could be one of the people that put in. I don't, I doubt it, but I mean, could be. I mean, they're a company, and I guess they could have bid zero. Uh, my guess is they'd say, well, ours is out there if you want it, you know, we don't need to bid on it, but uh, if, if Beth's here, she'll, she'll I, be there. I would just like to know the comparisons as far as, I mean, so, I know Khan Academy doesn't work for every student, but um, it is free. Yeah. So if you want to, Beth is on her way down. Okay. And it's a quality program, and it makes a lot of, meets the needs of a lot of kids. And the price is right. I'm sure they'd take $4 million a week. <laughs> and they have a cool tutoring thing now, too. You can sign up for free tutoring and meet with one of their people. Pretty neat. Jim because he never gets around to do anything. I'll, and I'll get the rest of them at some point. If, if that's the one you don't have. So 
I'll slap him around. One good thing about our agency is you can get easily uh, thousands of steps in if you just want to walk it, and Beth is on that side of the building and on the sixth floor, so uh, she, she'll be here. And, and they, she was watching, but it's delayed, so so we're, you know, it's just a minute or two delayed, but you're like, oh, what's going on? Beth, you've been called to the office. <laughs> You're in high demand. It feels like it. So, how uh, can I help you? <laughs> well, I think they had some questions around computer science, but I think first is the RFP process on the math tutoring program. Could you just update everyone? And I think Michelle may have had some questions. Okay, so we had uh, seven uh, vendors submit proposals for the math RFP. We had to make one change. Um, per uh, recommendation by multiple people, uh, probably mostly the Department of Administration, because when we had bid it, we had said we wanted K-12, and um, <clears throat> there might not be anything available for K-12. It might be two different awards, one that's going to take care of part of the grades and one that would take care of the other, but we haven't, I can't say that for sure yet, but we had to take that requirement off the the proposal during the question and answer time. Uh, so <clears throat> we have, um, we're using some math experts that we've hired as our part-time staff to do the initial review and they'll order those. Then we'll have an internal group that we'll go through and see if we agree. Then it goes back to the Department of Administration to get cost proposals. So we do all that blind of the cost. Then we'll look at the cost proposals and make our recommendations. So the the goal is to um, you know, be able to bring that to you next month in December. We'll, we'll move through that fairly quickly uh, for the for the review and everything. It's, we're comfortable doing that process. Okay. And did you have anything on computer science? Uh, <coughs> no, I I've talked to Dr. King about it, but I guess we need a list for. Um, what is a computer science class? Oh, I thought you were talking about the grant money. Okay, so, well, let me talk about the grant money first. There um, was some uh, money awarded by the legislature for professional development for the um, computer science teachers, right? And so that um, will be coming to you next month also on, the, it'll be a consent agenda item, but who the recommended uh, people would be for the award and then we'll be prepared to issue those letters immediately following uh, your decision. So that part of it's moving forward. The um, part of the bill that you might get some calls on that I'll give you a brief update on. Uh, also within that legislation required a survey of the school districts on what um, career and technical education courses they've been teaching and certifications and that type of thing. And that's, uh, we're gonna pilot that with a few school districts next week, and then that will go out. So we'll be um, able to make that report to the legislature and be in compliance in January. Uh, so be able to share that information with you at that time too on current technical education courses of which computer science would be part of that. So then your question about the definition of a computer science yeah, course? Yeah, we kind of wondering if, uh, of course, we have now a computer science or a STEM requirement, which includes computer science. So we need a list of classes that would meet the graduation requirement for <clears throat> computer science and then see if, if we don't substantially have every district already providing one that would meet the requirements of 2466 where every district has to provide a computer science class. 
So we have a list of approved courses within the pathway, um, but but then I understand it's broader than that. Yeah. Uh, so um, certainly we can go back. Yeah. Through and then that there's and there's that other computer science list that we would accept for a math or science credit, right. but that's that's another right. list. Yeah. Right. So that's part of what we'll be collecting with this survey we're going to send out. Um, well, the thing was, the schools wanted to know, OK, which computer science classes do I have to provide to meet the 2466 requirements? And they're also going to be asking which ones we will accept to satisfy graduation. But that ought to be like the same list, I'm thinking. Much the same list, yeah. Hope. I think, I think by, um, by January, we, we shouldn't have any problem providing that. I think um, given the, the dates of the survey and when it's going out and how long it might take uh, districts to complete it, it's a pretty hefty survey. Um, it'll probably be, be your January board meeting before we'd be able to share those results. Anything else for Beth? Okay. Well, thank you. See, that sure. wasn't too bad to be called to the office, was it? I could at least answer that. Okay. So we will be actually making decisions on our uh, prior positions next month, our legislative positions next month. Point of personal privilege. We had several, if, if we go back and look at our agenda for yesterday and today, we had numerous issues that uh, that were difficult to deal with we had numerous issues where we had different people oppose and different people support and i want to compliment my colleagues because we did that without rancor and that is not something that has happened normally uh, if you look at political organizations that is, and, and, and one of the things that I, during my eight years on this board, and we've had all sorts of different people in that eight years, you know, as a matter of fact, most of you weren't here when I got here, and I was the new kid at, at that time, uh, from, different, from different political points of view, uh, but it has always been a group that respected each other, and I uh, want to compliment all of my colleagues on the fact that we got through some difficult things today that we didn't agree on all, but we got through it uh, what I consider to be the appropriate adult way. And uh, I want to thank you for that. And with that, we are adjourned.